after. Captain Garrick, would you like me to uh, do the introductions? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome back. Um, just to formally introduce myself, I am Lieutenant David Steinberg and my co-host is Captain Trevor Garrick. Today is the second session in our review of the study material for the Jaeger Award exam. In the first session, we covered part one of the uh, textbook, uh, which covered the rich history of air power, and it spanned the first six chapters of the textbook. Um, that material uh, obviously uh, was in the email, so I'm not going to go into that now. Uh, today, we are going to cover part two, the principles of flight and navigation, and hopefully we'll get into part three as well, the aerospace community. So if you missed the first class or would just like to review what we've covered, there will be a recording that will be made available and hopefully uh, in the near future, that'll be uploaded to our website for everyone to uh, access. And as we did last time, we will briefly review an outline of this study material. And then we're gonna have a brief quiz at the end of each chapter. Feel free to discuss those questions. And if you have any other questions uh, you may have, we'll, we'll talk about those at the end of the chapter itself uh, before moving on. So for today, we're anticipating the class will run two, maybe two and a half hours. We'll see how it goes. And uh, without further ado, Captain Garrick will start us off with chapter seven of part two. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Captain Derek here for the next uh, hour or so. I will be your presenter on part two of part two of the journey of flight third edition. And we will begin with chapter seven, basic aeronautics and aerodynamics on 79 to 195. And I'm sure you're seeing what I'm seeing on my screen. So you can, uh, for those who has the presentation on their screen, you can just follow through. Um, <clears throat> we are not necessarily gonna follow the time slot here. We're just gonna try to move it along, but at a pace where you can understand. And then at the end, as David said, we will um, take a few, we will present a few questions and answers. Now, the objective of this section is um, after completing this chapter, the student should be able to explain the difference between aeronautics and aerodynamics, understand the properties of air that are important to flight, understand why scientists use simplifying assumptions during study, define airfoil, know the parts of an airfoil, describe the concepts of relative wind, angle of attack, and streamlines, describe Bernoulli's principle, give examples of aircraft characteristics that can improve each force, explain how the loss of one force affects the other three forces, describe the real world effects of viscosity and a compressible airflow, name two effects. Wings have on an airflow not accounted for by airfoils. And as I mentioned in my previous lectures, the objectives kind of give you an outline as to how the, in my opinion, how the questions might be posed in the, uh, in the exam. And if you pay attention to that, it's kind of give a summary of what is expected for each chapter. Now, <clears throat> pay particular attention uh, attention flying has fascinated people for a long time in the world. And um, that's what led us to this point where throughout the decades, mankind has always wanted to fly. And so throughout experimenting and, you know, tapping into each other resources or experiments, it, it gets better and better as you go by. So let's dig into the meat of the matter. Now, the realm of flight, the 
composition of properties of air. As you know, um, our atmosphere is made, made up of 79% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and 1% of other gases. Now about extending up to about 100 miles, um, the pressure, density, and temperature changes. Now the pressure is the greatest on the Earth's surface because it's in the lower part of the atmosphere. Think of it as, as they would use that example as several blanket stocks on each other. So the pressure decreases on incre an increase in altitude, or if you want to, I like to use the triangle. You know, the apex of the triangle is like smaller at the top, and at the base it's much wider. So if you think about it like that, as you go up, <clears throat> the pressure gets less and less. And at the base of the triangle, it's get heavier and heavier. And we'll explore that in a minute. Now, the standard pressure for the atmosphere is 14.7 pounds per square inch, or 29.92 inches of mercury. And it weighs, uh, the right, 14.7 pounds per square, square inch and 29.92 inches of mercury. And that is on a standard day. 15 degrees, I believe. Now, temperature is a measure of energy. So what you find is the hotter the air, you have more molecules moving about randomly. And the more colder the air is, the more compact the molecules are. That means they are more sticking together. They are not, they're not energized. They're not moving about quickly. Now, the standard, um, lapse rate in our atmosphere is about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit per thousand feet. That means as you go up, the temperature, the atmosphere, temp atmospheric temperature decreases three and a half degrees per thousand feet. The density of the atmosphere, as I mentioned to you before, right where we are right now, the density it's much greater. And if you go back to the triangle again, as you go higher into the atmosphere, into the troposphere, into the mesosphere, the stratosphere, you find that the density decreases as you go higher. And that is why, like if you're taking off from a high altitude airport, the aircraft has to have less weight, you know, it has to have uh, more speed because the air is thinned. So that aerodynamic reaction over the wings get lessened. So viscosity has to do with the flow of the air. And, and of course, it ties in with density. So the more viscous and dense the air is, the more compact it is. The less viscous it is, is, is uh, it's the, 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 the free flow it, it will be. Think about it like water and oil. Oil is a little bit thicker. That means it has more viscosity and water is less thicker. So it flows fluently. Laminar flow, the flow pattern, that, that has to do with the shape of the wing. So in earlier times, like, you know, during World War One, World War Two and even go down to the right brothers, the, the wing thickness, the camber thickness of the wing is greater than what we call laminar flow today. Laminar flow that is a little bit thinner. That means it, it creates less turbulence over the wing, um, um, less resistance. It still has a certain amount of resistance, but it's, it's more free flowing. It flows smoothly through the air. So that, that is kind of a more um, 20th century design. The speed of the sound in air. Again, sound waves travel like ripples in water. So if you, kind of, like if you ever go to a pond and you drop a stone in the water, you see those circular ripples extending outwards. And sometimes maybe the bigger that stone is, the more frequency of ripples you will have in terms of wavelengths. And a small stone probably, probably produce less ripples. So sound waves, when it travels through the air, 
gets affected by the density of the air. And you're going to see how the density, the pressure, and temperature all ties in together with respect to aerodynamics. So the less dense the air is, the sound travels faster. Um, the more dense it is, it travels uh, slower. So because it has to you know, bounce on those compact molecules and less light molecules. Now, there was a Austrian physicist, Ernst Mach, and I'm sure you're familiar with the word Mach number. And that number is derived, or I should have, that name is derived from this physicist called Mach. And that is determined the correct mathematical value for the speed of sound. So really and truly, Mach is just really the, the speed of the sound as it moves through the air. Its last name plus the number one after it represents the speed of the sound through a fluid medium. So you get Mach one. So the speed of sound varies as altitude because temperature decreases with an increase in height. And we mentioned that before. Now the X one, which many of you are familiar with, um, when they were doing the experiments and they found out that a bullet travels faster than the speed of sound. They have created the X1 to simulate that effect. And no other than Brigadier General Chuck Yeager with the X1 exceeded that speed of sound on October 14, 1947. The airfoil designs that capture the energy of the wind. So again, if you go back to the airfoil and you want to look at it more in, in terms of uh, kind of a more in-depth way, the airfoil consists of uh, different parts. You have the, the front of it, which is the leading edge, and you have the rear of it, which is the trailing edge. And in the middle of it, you have what is called a cambered shape. Now, the cambered shape is really the depth or the the, the, the depth, the width of the, 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 the wing vertically. So the thinner the wing is, is the much faster it will move through the air. Just like looking at a Cessna wing versus a F-16 wing. The F-16 wing is much flatter while the Cessna is more thicker. And that, that is what makes the difference when you talk about laminar flow and you know, with respect to converge shape of the wing. And of course, the card line is really an imaginary line from the leading edge to the trailing edge. And the relative wind is what is being created when the airfoil moves through the air. So as the wing moves through the air, it is being opposed by the relative wind. So it's coming in contact with the relative wind and that's what causes that air to be spitted. Some goes over the top of the wing, some goes under the wing and those two effects will create different um, pressure points or pressure with respect to speed which creates a downwash which causes an upward movement which is produced by uh, what is called by lift. Now Daniel Bernoulli he's a Dutch physicist in 1738 he discovered that he, he discovers the relationship between pressure and speed. And what he discovered is that when a, if the speed of air speeds up in a venturi, it creates a low pressure at the back end. And if the pressure increases, it creates a low speed. And if you look at the wing carefully, you will see the wing. If you cut a Venturi in half, everybody know what a Venturi is. It's, it's like an hourglass. And if you take the inside of the hourglass, those curvature, it would be the cambered shape of the upper part of the wing because the bottom part of the wing is flat. So you have this curvature at the top and you have this kind of flattening portion at the bottom. And so what you find as the wing moves through the air is that the air flowing over the top of the wing is, is flowing at a faster speed over the camber. 
So as it moves beyond the camber, at the back end of, on top of the wing, it's create a low pressure. Now, let's look at the bottom of the wing. At the bottom of the wing, the air is moving at a, sorry, faster pace, slower pace, which create, sorry, faster pace, which create a high pressure. And so when both air meets at the trailing edge, so you have low pressure at the top, high pressure at the bottom. So when it meets at the bottom of the wing, it combines and causes what is called an upward force, which we go back to um, Newton's third law of motion. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So that upward force pushes the wing upward that causes lift. So let's look at the four forces of flight. The four forces are lift, drag, thrust, and weight. Now, lift acts perpendicular to the relative wind. That means a 90 degree angle to the relative wind. And the opposite of lift is what we call uh, weight. So those two are acting in a vertical plane. So we have lift being upward like that. And at the bottom of the wing, we have drag pulling it down. It's like, you know, drag and gravity working hand in hand. And we have what is called thrust. Now thrust is like propeller, the jet engine. And what it does is to push the airplane forward as it moves through the air. Like a propeller creates a corkscrew motion and it's pulling the air and thus causes the airplane to move forward. At the opposing end of thrust, we have drag so drag is really trying to slow down thr thrust like slow it down so we have lift weight thrust and we have drag and each oppose each other lift with respect to weight thrust with respect to drag now as and each one of them has to balance each other in level flight so we create an equilibrium anytime one of them is more than one. For example, if you're climbing, you are out, you, you, you tend to have more thrust. So thrust is greater than drag. So what happened? It's not in equilibrium because one is greater than the other. But if you look at an airplane in level flight, when you have it set up constant altitude, constant airspeed, thrust equal drag, lift equal weight because it's not out of equilibrium. So let's move down to, and um, just to highlight that in our modern times here, with respect to older times, we try in, in older times, they use canvas and so on to, for the skin of the aircraft. In our modern days here, they try to use like uh, aluminum and fiberglass, which is, which is very light. And there's a reason for that. You want to create less weight, and you want to create less drag. And that is the ultimate goal in any design. You, you, you always want more thrust. Fighter jets, they have extraordinary amount of thrust as it moves through the air. And, and, and for that, it's for a particular reason, to move fast, get out of the enemy territory, and just to have more speed for new maneuverability. Now let's look at the real world lift and weight. Now, as mentioned to you before, as a airfoil moves through the air and as it creates lift, it also creates some form of turbulence. At the top of the, uh, of, of the wing, and as you increase that angle of attack, that means the angle between the cord line and the relative wind, as you pitch up and you increase that angle of attack, what you find is that on the upper camber of the wing, the air starts to get burbled, turbulent. And if you continue to pitch, 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 you're, you're actually cutting off the flow of the air over the wing. So think about it like this. So you pitch up, so the air is flowing like this when you're in level flight. And as you pitch up, 
the air is getting less at the top. And as you pitch up more, it's struggling to try to create lift. And so at the top of the camber towards the training edge, it gets more burbled and that burble or turbulence start to move forward to the leading edge. And it reaches to a point where the airplane will stall. And when it stall, it cuts off the airflow of the wing. So it loses its lift capability. The real world thrust and drag. No, no. So as the airplane moves through the air and lift is being created, remember what I said earlier, lift is perpendicular to drag. So if you form a 90 degrees, you have lift at the top here and drag on the back end. And so what you find happening is that you have what is called uh, resultant force. So you have lift, it's, it's like you have lift and you have a horizontal force of lift. And in the middle, it, it, it causes a resultant force between the two forces or a vector, which really means magnitude and direction. And how much lift do you have versus horizontal force of lift or drag? And so because if you have more lift, then what you find is that you have what? You have lift in the vertical, which is the direction, and then the resultant force would be the magnitude. Now, so vectoring allows for a plane, plane's thrust to be pointed in a particular direction. And I mentioned that before, lift act vertically, drag act horizontally, and in between you have the resultant force or the horizontal um, force of lift. And induced drag, is really when the uh, airplane wing creates lift that adds to the drag. So you can think about induced drag as um, when the aircraft create induced lift, it also creates induced drag. And drag is in everything, as I said, induced drag, parasite drag. And parasite drag is just when the air moves over the aircraft, the friction that is created on the surface of the aircraft tends to want to slow the aircraft down or those parts of the aircraft that does not contribute to lift like the landing gear, um, the strut, those are what is called parasite drag. They have no, they have no value in terms of the aircraft producing more lift. <clears throat> so supersonic flow, so supersonic aerodynamics, supersonic flow, if an airplane travels at supersonic speeds, the air ahead receives no warning of the airplane's approach because the airplane is out, out speeding its own pressure wave. So what you have is that the airplane is moving faster in the air. So the flow of the wing creates a pressure point, which tends to move rearward as the airplane moves faster, which also create compressibility and drag. So wave drag, as a result of that, is a loss of energy over the wing. Okay, so that is the end of chapter seven. So I'm gonna throw out a few uh, tests and questions, and I'm just going to see if I can put that in the share. Let me see if I can. Uh, It doesn't seem as if I can. All right, let me let me try it this way. I can, uh, right, it's working. I just want to throw about four out and let you guys answer those questions. All right, put this. Oh, I want to mess this up. One second. I put this in share, right, David? No, the chat window. Oh, the chat window. Yeah, that would, then everyone can see it in the chat window. The chat window. There should be a button on the bottom of your window for the chat. Oh, second, let me find that.
Okay, got it. All right, so go ahead and uh, just quickly, how many questions are there? All right, so go ahead and just look at those questions briefly. And I'll just- uh, it's, uh, I'm not seeing it on, on the chat side. Hang on a second. I didn't post it, huh? Hang on one second, let me redo this. Now you see it? Ah, all right, it's there. Okay, so let's start with number one. Uh, John, can you go ahead and answer number one? <laughs> When an object is placed in the path of a moving air, the mutual attraction of the molecules slows the rate of flow. This is called what? No pressure. <laughs> what, what was that? He answered. Okay. D, okay. Yep. All right, good. Um, Major. Casentino, number two. Yep. Um, oh, I didn't answer in the chat. Can I do it verbally? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. So um, I also got to tell you that the answers are kind of given as they're darkened on the letters oh. on the PDF. But I happen to know this one. <laughs> yes. The one that's missing there is vector D. All right, D. Okay. All right. So I got to do that a different way next time. Yeah. All right, so number three, John, you can take number three. And then Maurice, you can take number four. Sure. The angle between the chord line and the oncoming relative wind best, best defined as? He's muted. Oh, you're muted, John. Unmute yourself, please. All right, guys. Uh, angle of attack. All right, good. And uh, Maurice, you can take number four. Bernoulli's principle, as the velocity of fluid increases, the pressure decreases. And that's why we fly. Okay, great. Excellent. Good job. Now, I want you to understand that, for those who are taking the exam, that in the journey of flight, it kind of gives you an outline of the type of questions that will be administered in the in the Jaeger test, whether it's multiple choice, true and false, short answer essay type questions. So, so when you go through the chapters on your own, please do the quizzes after the chapter or at the back of the journey of flight. And that will help you greatly because what we are presenting here, we are just pre presenting the main points that will be um, key for you to pass in the exam. So let's move to um, chapter eight. So this is, I'm, I'm assuming this is open book test, correct? Yes, it is open book. So that's added advantage to you on top of what you already know in terms of knowledge. So right. I, I would, I would um, encourage you to read through the book. You don't, you don't have to go on overkill. Just read to understand and make your points and go through the questions because it's very important for you to understand not, not, not just to do the Jaeger test, but to understand what you're doing. And as, as you said, John, you work in a museum. This is a great backdrop oh, great. to you great. doing your presentations. And yeah. as you go through, you will see that it, it provides very valuable knowledge to you. Okay. Well, I don't do I don't do presentation. I'm the AV guy. I do their projection. I do all their uh, audio video. That's what I do for them. Okay. So I'm the, I'm their tech guy. I'm not their flight guy. I win. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, you never know when somebody walk up to you and say, "Hey, John." There is no doubt about I, that, and I want to have the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I got a question though about yeah. this. Just in just what we're talking about. Um, do, does the book, since I don't have it really, you know, does it give you illustrations? See, my everybody learns differently. Okay, yeah. everybody learns differently. It gives you, it does give you some illustration, and it does give you pictures. 
Yeah. So, you know, when you were doing this and that and all, I mean, that helps. That, that yes. really helps me understand. Sorry about that. I didn't have the, I probably have to use my phone as the wing. <laughs> no, that, but, okay. Yes. But it, it was does. good what you were doing. It was good what you were doing. It, it, it does. It I, I tried to use another form. Trying to read. It does. So it will, It you will get all that stuff in the book. We're just presenting the main points to help you to understand so that when you start reading or you should have read before you started this course, but I understand, but it will give you a, a better backdrop in terms of um, knowledge as you go, understanding as you go through yeah. uh, the, the chapters. Understood. Okay, so any other questions? All right. All right, so we're going to move to aircraft in motion. And uh, the objective of this section, I'll just read it quickly, is uh, after completing of this chapter, the student should be able to identify the basic parts of a conventional airplane, the three axes of rotation, the location of the three axes, identify the three different types of fuselage classification, why box construction is better than wire support, describe how the use of aluminum on composites in aircraft construction improve each force of flight, identify the purpose of the landing gear, describe three types of landing gear arrangements, describe the typical functions of aircraft fuel systems, describe the typical functions of aircraft hydraulic systems, electrical systems, um, aircraft instruments, Classify the three major groups of aircraft instruments by their uses and the three major groups of aircraft instruments by their principles of operation. And lastly, describe any one new concept in aviation. So let's dive straight into it. Now, the axis of aircraft, just like when we talk about uh, lift, drag, thrust, sorry, lift, weight, drag, lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The airplane have different axes in which the airplane moves. And when we talk about the longitudinal axis, we're talking about, um, David, if you want, you can hold your plane up. <laughs> that will be helpful. <laughs> so, and you can point to it as I move through it. So the longitude, the longitudinal axis is a imaginary line that runs from the nose of the aircraft to the, to the tail of the aircraft. So it's like a line that like is through the aircraft and movement around the longitudinal axis is called roll. And we accomplish roll by using the ailerons. You know, those like a flops at the end of the wing one move up, one move down, it causes the aircraft. So when you move the yoke or the control column, left or right, like a car steering wheel, you're actually rolling the aircraft into a turn or into a bank. And, and that, that bank is caused by the aileron, but you're also moving around what is called a longitudinal axis. The lateral axis, which we call pitch. So the longitudinal is roll and the lateral is pitch. So that's, again, a line that runs from wingtip to wingtip. So it's an imaginary line that runs from wingtip to wingtip. And when you pull on the yoke towards you or push the yoke away from you forward, you are causing the aircraft to pitch up above the horizon and you causing it to pitch down below the horizon. So that is what is called lateral axis. And movement around the lateral axis is called pitch. The vertical axis is again an imaginary line that runs vertically through the vertical fin from top to bottom and movement around the vertical axis is called yaw. And that is accomplished by when you press the rudder in the aircraft, left and right, you have movement that causes the nose of the aircraft to yaw to the left and nose of the aircraft to yaw to the right. So those are the three axes 
of an aircraft, longitudinal axis, which is roll, lateral axis, which is pitch, and vertical axis, which is yaw. Now let's look at the structure of the aircraft structures and components. Now, as you know, many of you may know, you are familiar with basically two types of engine. If it's not reciprocating engine, it's jet engine, okay? So we have um, reciprocating engine and we have turbine engine, which we call jet. Now the reciprocating engine is more of a conventional type of uh, engine. And that those engines are used on like uh, 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 Cessnas, you know, some, you know, smaller aircraft, Pipers, you know, Beechcraft, you know, and they are also used for transportation, work and pleasure, such as cars. They are in cars. The car engine is a reciprocating engine. Lawnmowers, motorcycles, boats, etc. The reciprocating engine means that certain parts move back and forth. So inside that engine, you have what? Pistons, you have crankshaft, you have rods, rocker arm, and they all move. So that's what reciprocating engine means. Okay, they all move in, in, in motion based on the combustion that takes place inside of the engine. Now, we're gonna look at the operation of the engine. Now, I, I just want to highlight to you that you will see that as we get down into jet propulsion, that they all use the same principle. It has to have some intake of air. It has to have some form of compressibility of the air. It has to have some form of introduction of fuel in that compressibility of air. And you do what? Ignite it. And when you ignite it, it creates what? A explosion. And that explosion is what creates the the thrust for the airplane to move forward. So let's take a deeper look at that. So the cylinder is where fuel is converted into energy. So we have what is called a intake stroke. So a intake stroke, when you look at the piston, as the piston moves from top dead center to bottom dead center, it creates a vacuum. So it sucks in that air into the cylinder. Okay, and as it moves from bottom dead center, so you have the intake stroke, which begins the piston from top dead center. And as that cylinder, and remember, well, you have more than one cylinder, so they are doing different things at different times. You call that the timing, the timing of the pistons. So as that, we're looking at the compression stroke, as that crankshaft drives the piston upward, it introduces what? fuel inside the cylinder. So that fuel and air mixture is being compressed as it moves to the top dead center from the bottom dead center. And when it compresses, what happened is that there's ignition. And when there is ignition it or a spark, in that compressibility of air and fuel, it creates an explosion. And that explosion will drive the piston down. And in return, it will turn the crankshaft. And when it turns the crankshaft, we get that um, it, it, it causes the propeller to spin or the wheels of a car to turn, okay? And then of course, as it moves from bottom dead center after the compressibility, after the compression stroke, it has to find a way to get rid of the waste. So we talk about what is called the exhaust stroke. And the exhaust stroke, the exhaust valve will open and it will get rid of that exhaust gas by way of what we call the, uh, the muffler or exhaust uh, uh, pipe. And as I mentioned to you before, in return, that action, the, the crankshaft will turn or spin the propeller and the propeller will create thrust as it moves through the air and creates forward motion. 
Now let's take a look at the turbine engine. The aircraft turbine engines, the turbine means well and refers to any type of wheel device that has veins. So instead of having crankshaft, is crankshaft, pistons, you know, uh, rods, valves, the, 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 the engine has four basic parts. You have the turbojet, basic types rather. You have the turbojet, the turbofan, the turboprop, and prop fan. The principle of operation, the turbine takes, and, and let me just highlight this as we go along. So for the reciprocating engine, it takes a large amount of air because if you look at the propeller, it's a huge airfoil. The propeller itself is an airfoil, like the wing. So as it spins through the air, it's pulling air in a corkscrew motion. So it takes a large amount of air to produce a small amount of thrust as the aircraft moves through the air. For the turbine engine, it takes a small amount of air to produce a large amount of thrust. And that is why jets fly at very high altitude and go at very fast speed because the air is very dense. And because the air is very dense, it takes a small amount of air and produce a large thrust. Whereas the reciprocated engine, they can still fly high. I mean, you know, up 30,000 feet, depending on the top. Wood. But at, at a lower altitude, it takes a small amount of, a large amount of air to produce a small amount of thrust. So let's look at the turbine engine. Now, it uses a fan like compressor blades to bring air into the engine. So here we have like the, the engine, David, and you have the inlet. And as the air comes in the inlet, it goes through, go, goes through, uh, go to the compressor. And just like the reciprocated engine, when you have the compression stroke that comes up to compress the air and the fuel, it's the same thing with the jet engine those veins compresses because they are neatly put together and they have so many veins. As the air moves through those veins, it compresses the air. And then as it compresses the air, it moves that air into the eye compressor section where fuel and ignition will be introduced. And that is like the power stroke of the, uh, reciprocated engine. And so as that compressed air is lit, those gases expand. And as it expands and moves rearward, it goes to what is called the high, high pressure turbine. So you have the low pressure turbine, which is the compressor, and you have the high pressure turbine, which takes that explosion or that hot air when it's exploded, and it creates a force, a high thrust, and that, what, that is what causes the jet to move fast in the air because as it exhausts those hot air, it, it is pushing the airplane forward. So those hot gases strike the blades of the turbine and cause it to spin rapidly. And when it spins, the turbine, what it causes the compressor section to do is to compress those, uh, those hot air with those blades, and then it creates that thrust, which causes the airplane to move forward. And Trevor, yes, I saw there there was a, um, a battery life. You you need to plug in, or you're going to lose all of us soon. Did you see that um, come up on your uh, desktop there? Okay, let me just you, check you that. Again, if you look at your icon, it's very low. You will lose every you'll you'll lose every. It's still there. Uh, it's still there. You got to make sure you plug it in. Still there. There it goes. Uh, good, Trevor. Whatever you did. No, no. Now, now you're not good. So I guess your plug needs to be wiggled or something. Yeah, I have a short on it. So how is it now? It, it's oh, going it's back. Here. Okay, I see it. All you right. See oh. it. All right. Let me fix this quickly. 
See, Dave, that's that's why I get paid the big bucks at the at the museum. <laughs> It's good to have a tech guy on staff. Okay, so we're back on track. Okay, so good. Yeah, good. So, yeah you're good. So, all right, so let's get back on track. So the turbofan engine is uh, one or more rows of compressed blades extend beyond the normal compressor. So um, all those blades are in a, like a symmetrical form. So they are all like in one straight line. So you have the low compressor section, then you have the high compressor section, and then the compressor section, um, the air is being compressed, ignite, goes through the end of the eye compressor, which produces uh, a, eye, a, a large amount of power or thrust, which causes the aircraft to move forward. So let's look at the turboprop. Now the turboprop is really a jet engine, but it's just that it's working in the reverse order in terms of um the uh, uh let's, let's let's go through it so combines the best feature of the turbojet and propeller aircraft turboprop uses a gas turbine to turn a propeller and if you notice on the regular jet you do not have a propeller but for the turboprop what you have it has a auxiliary section that will turn the propeller or in that auxiliary section you have like several gears that will attach so that instead of having just the straight exhaust coming at the rear end it's like you turn that uh jet engine in the opposite direction so that auxiliary section will turn that propeller so that the propeller um spins and create thrust so it's nothing more than an auxiliary section that attaches to the turbine engine that turns the propeller the profan systems thrusters resembles a ship's screw more than it does an airplane propeller. The profan combines the air moving efficiency of the turbofan engines with the thrusting efficiency of the propeller. And that's something that we don't use much um, right now in, in, in general aviation. It's mostly um, reciprocating engine, turboprop, or jet engine. Ram is, there example, is there an example of a prop fan uh, in in military or any kind of aircraft that you can I can relate to, that's um, that's current or not current? I don't have one to show you right now, um, and I'm I don't remember if one is in the journey of flight, but it's something that I can check on and get back to you, or something that you can maybe Google and yeah. uh, see what it's I, like. Okay. I do remember that NASA did some testing. This is maybe 25 years ago where they were trying to replace a jet engine uh, with a prop fan. And I don't think it worked out that um, it was gonna be economical to put it into production. So it was a good test, but I don't think it, uh, it really gave them the positive results that they were looking for. I'll try to look that up actually right now. And if I can find the link to that, I'll put it into the chat below. Yeah, that would be good, David. Thank you. Ramjet, scramjets. Um, this is the simplest type of uh, jet engines with no moving parts. And it's basically um, having a jet engine where at high speed, air is just crammed or rammed into it, compressed and ignite. And, when you do that, then you get what is called thrust. So that's basically what a ramjet basically is. The force of inertia rams air into a streamlined chamber of fast flying ramjet. And ramjet scramjet has to be traveling through the air very fast before it is start, started. Um, earlier on, I think in the 1940s, they had done a lot of experiments on that. And I think even recently, um, they have done some experiments on that where you can have like, uh, like this, the B-52 goes up at a very high altitude and drops one of those uh, bombs. And what happened is as it leaves that high altitude coming down, the air is being rammed into the intake, compresses, and it creates an ignition in, in, when that air is compressed and causes the, an extraordinary amount of thrust. So that's basically, that's nothing of great 
significance to that, like a regular jet engine with all those low compressor turbine, high compressor turbine and fins and fans. It's just, uh, and, and you will see that in the book as well, it's just a um, inlet that allows a large amount of air to come in inside a, a chamber at very high speed. It compresses and ignites and then create thrust. So that's all it is to um, Ramjet. Flight controls. Now, Wilbur and Arville Wright gave the aviation field sustained, controlled, and powered flight. And as I mentioned in my previous lecture, um, previously you, you did have aircraft that flies, but they are, they are the ones that really created an aircraft or made an aircraft that sustained controlled flight. Powered flight, it's very important, powered flight. So flaps are attached to the trailing edge of the wing. And um, some of you might be familiar with that already. The flap increases the camber shape of the wing and of course creates drag. So, and also helps to create lift and take off. You have a certain amount of flap set that creates lift for the aircraft to take off from a short field or a short runway. And of course, when you're coming into land, you have, uh, hang on a second, some people are trying to, all right, and, and, and coming into land, it creates drag and, you know, with a lesser speed or a slower speed with a steeper angle of descent. Now, slots are protrusions from the leading edge of the wing. And again, that's another type of device that's helped to create lift and prevents the aircraft from stalling. And when you're flying, you probably sit at the window of a jet, a jumbo jet, and you'll see these little slots projected forward with a opening behind it. It's really because the jet takes off at a slow speed, it's really to help the aircraft create more lift, delay the boundary layer separation, so it does not stall and creates more lift as it moves through the air. Is this on top of the leading edge? No, it's in, it's it's at the leading edge, right? Or at the top of it, in the front, or just the top of it? Where? Oh, at the front, at the front of it. Okay. But it's kind of cambered to when it's retracted. It's kind of some of it kind of cambered, like as if it's going over the upper camber. But okay. it's at the leading edge. But it's just really to create that smooth um, um, fit, so that it doesn't create drag and the pilot can extend it for takeoff and landing um, so that the aircraft has more lift and doesn't cause the air to separate. Oh, that's right, that's right. That moves forward as the flaps go down. Right, right? and you have the flaps at the back and you have the flaps at the front. And that goes forward. So this would, be, this would be the aircraft in motion, okay? So here, that goes down. Right. And then the, the flaps also go down. Right. And so, that actually then thickens the camber. Is that the idea? Well, what it does is kind of extend the, the, the camber. The flaps extend the camber. Yeah. The flat, it kind of extends the camber in a leading edge, but it also has a slot, like a space between the camber. And it, the purpose of that is to, is to the, prevent the air from um, from separating from the wing at an early stage, so it does not stall the aircraft. So it helps to create more lift at yeah. slow air speeds. Because yeah. remember, jets are designed to operate at very high air speed, high altitude. They are very inefficient at low altitude. And because they are very inefficient at low altitude, they burn more fuel because you have more drag based on the delta shape of the wing. If you look at the wing, it's kind of slant to a certain degree, especially fighters. They are very inefficient at low, low speed. Mm. And because they're set at an angle, like for example, 18 degrees rearward, like a delta shape, mm -hmm. it creates more drag because the air, it does, it's not designed to fly at slow speed. So you have to compensate that by having some kind of device that helps to sustain lift. And Got the slot help to do that by preventing that separation at an early stage. Now, um, so that's the slot. 
spoilers are another type of device. And David, you can highlight that as well. The spoilers are found on the top of the wing. Like, like this is the wing. The spoilers, they can flick. Right, the little, it's, the like little, that. it's that like little flap, flap that comes right. up. That pops up. Yeah. And then you have, you have spoilers that are inboard and spoilers that are outboard. Mm. And at high speeds, the spoilers that are outboard are shut down because you don't want to twist the wings and break them off right. at high speed. So the inboard flaps are used, but at low speed, both of them are used, um, indoor, outdoor. So they are located on top of the, the airfoil, on top of the wing. And those are drug devices, by the way, flaps, spoilers, they're all drug devices. They are designed to slow the aircraft down. At high altitude, again, you can use um, you can use uh, spoilers to create drag for the aircraft to descend quickly from one altitude to the next or to meet a particular altitude. So if you're going from 25,000 to 20,000 and let's say ATC says that, hey, you gotta, you gotta meet that cross restriction at 20,000, you can put some um, spoilers in to create drag for the aircraft to descend quickly. And as well, when you when you land as well, you also use spoilers to help to slow the aircraft down on the runway, so it doesn't overspeed and run off the runway. I and, remember, yeah. I remember when I was flying sailplanes. I'm a model pilot. pilot okay, yeah. so I, I, I used to fly sailplanes, and I had an 11 foot wingspan. And what that thing was? It, it, it was quite a quite a vehicle, but the spoilers it, they came straight up. It was like it blocked the wind. It didn't. It didn't flap like this. It came straight up like like a block. Yes. And that would come off the top of the wing to slow the plane down. Exactly. But but it it, it didn't. It but the mechanism wasn't like like that. It was like this, and the wind would be hitting it directly, yes. like, and that would slow the plane down. We called them right. spoilers. We called them spoilers. Yes, spoilers. Yes. It's they a can drug be different device. shapes. They can they they can come in different shapes and sizes. I guess. Yes. yes, yes, they are, and that's a good point. The fuselage structure. Now, the fuselage is the main body of the aircraft. So, again, means the shape like a spindle to streamline. So, there are usually three classifications of the fuselage. You can either use trust monocoque and semi-monocoque. And every, I think most of you might be familiar with truss, like a truss bridge. You know, those triangular shape connections, monocoque using tubes to connect and make the frame of the aircraft. And at some point you can use truss and um, um, monocoque in the design as well, semi-monocoque. So fuselage should be covered with strongest, lightest material that can be uh, manufactured and fitted to the fuselage, generally aluminum, sheeting, or composite material, right? So in back in the days, uh, they use uh, canvas, you know, now in our modern times, um, they use uh, aluminum, fiberglass. Landing gear. I don't know if they're going to talk about the different types of uh, parts of the fuselage, but the fuselage really consists of a couple of main parts. And I'm just showing this out before, so just in case it doesn't highlight it later on in the chapter. You have the fuselage, you have the propulsion system, which is the engine, you have the landing gear, you have the wings, you have the empennage, which is the tail section, which consists of the elevator or stabilizers and the vertical fin, which consists of the rudder. So just bear that in mind as the main parts of the aircraft. As, yes, David. All right, so there David's showing you right off there. So that's the vertical fin. Then you have the elevators or stabilizers, horizontal stabilizer. Then you have uh, the, rod, the, the rudder. Then you have the rudder there. Then you have the wings the wings of the aircraft. Then you have the propulsion system, which are the engines. And then of course, the landing gear, 
which allows the aircraft to taxi and land. Okay, thank you, David. There are three types of landing gear arrangements in common use today, and he's showing you the landing gear right there. The conventional tricycle and tandem. The conventional consists of two wheels, and David, you can you can you can show that as well. The tricycle, the, the conventional two wheels towards the rear, and a nose wheel. Okay. The tricycle is the same thing. The tricycle, you have two wheels at the rear, in the middle, and you have uh, underneath the nose, you have a nose wheel. The tandem, have you ever seen like uh, the Blackbird? I should say the Aria Jet and mm, the, the B-52? Yes. Those are tandem, not the Blackbird. They, they are the, the Aria Jet. The Aria jet and the B-52, as well as the spy plane, we call it spy plane, you will see two large wheels in the middle, one at the front and one in the middle, and then you have two small wheels at the wing tip. Oh. So those two large wheels that you see there, like yeah. the rear, below the nose and in the middle, is called tandem, like, you know, um, the wheels are tandem. So... So you have tricycle, mean which is what? Three wheel, tri, which is three, two at the rear, one at the front, and tandem, one in front of each other. And then you have, of course, a uh, tail wheel aircraft, where you have two wheels in the middle and one at the tail, slant at an angle. Thank you, David. Then on those wheels, you will find that you have brakes, and those brakes are really controlled by, um, in, in, in our modern times, hydraulic brakes. Uh, maybe in earlier times, controlled by cable, but now it's being controlled by hydraulic, um, um, hydraulic pressure. And of course, you have landing gear that is fixed and landing gear that is retractable. So like a Cessna, those gears, some Cessnas, some aircraft, the gears are fixed. So the gears cannot be retracted. It stays there permanently. Now, like a, a fighter jet, a jumbo jet, some jets, the gears are folded up into the belly of the aircraft and into the nose. Those are called retractable landing gears. Okay? So the wheels can be folded up. All right? Now, the systems. Now, for any aircraft, though, any aircraft with a propulsion system to move through the air, it has to use some kind of fuel to create the combustion. So we have fuel systems, okay, that involves delivery of fuel to the engine. And we have to have fuel tanks to feed those engines with fuel. So there are two fuel feed systems. You have the gravity feed, which if you look at the Cessna, which, which has eye wings, because the wings are up in the air, gravity will pull that fuel down into the engine. So that is what is called gravity feed. So it pulls those fuel from the fuel tank through the fuel line down to the engine because it's high up into the air and the weight and pressure causes the fuel to push down into the fuel lines, into the engine. Then you have what is called, you know, so we have gravity feed, fuel, and we have force feed. So force feed is when we have an engine driven fuel pump or some sort of fuel pump. And most aircraft will have two types. You have the engine driven fuel pump, and then you have the fuel pump, an additional fuel pump that will prime the engine or feeds the engine with fuel. And it does that through the fuel lines, distribute the fuels through the fuel lines. Now, the hydraulic and electrical systems. I know we're talking about systems of the aircraft. So again, when we talk about systems, we're really talking about engines, brakes, lights, hydraulics, you know, uh, AC, you know, electrical systems, electronics, avionics. So 
the hydraulic systems means water tube. An aircraft hydraulic system may operate the brakes, it operates the landing gear, it moves the flight controls, like for larger jets, it uses hydraulic systems. For smaller aircraft, it uses cables to operate um, the, uh, the, 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 those control surfaces, like the flaps and so on. Some aircraft use electric, electric motors to extend flaps, retract flaps. So extend and lower the flaps. Electric systems, generator mechanical attached to an uh, aircraft engine provides the electricity to required to charge. Okay, so let me just wind down this section at the one hour. I'll try to really compress the other chapter, David, so that I can get you to start the other uh, portion no, of the No day. worries. You're doing I'm going to be moving a little bit faster. So the electrical system, oh, there's this thing again. Okay, so the electrical systems, which you still is- did, Trevor, you still got the problem. Yeah, I just saw it. I just tried to pull it out. My my um, connection at the back here is kind of loose. Okay. I just hate, to, we hate to lose you. You no. know, if the computer goes down, we'd hate to lose you. No, not gonna let that happen. All right, <laughs> so the generator mechanical attached to an aircraft engine provides the electricity to re required to charge the battery. So aircraft, they will have alternators, they will have generators. I think the newer aircraft, they have alternators because they are more efficient. They produce alternating current instead of direct current. And that is used to charge the batteries for lighting and so on. Aircraft instruments, early aircraft instruments, the first aviator relied on their senses because there were no flight instruments. And that must be hard because your vestibular, um, vestibular in your ear will create a lot of um, what you call uh, illusions. And if you don't have like instruments to rely on, you will get that false sense that the aircraft might be rolling, might be pitching. And so instruments are very important. So the earlier instruments were adequate for low and slow aircraft. And the classifications, the classification by principle of operation are mostly mechanical, pressure, and electrical. Mechanical means during direct mechanical linkage by using some kind of chain or cable or something. For example, gyroscopic stability, which, which is really a wheel spinning in a wheel, permanent wheel, which is wheel spinning, which um, <clears throat> a lot of our aircraft uses for, for example, uh, attitude indicator. And for military purposes, they use them in missiles, and so on. So pressure instruments work on the idea that fluid such as air exerts pressure. Electrical systems operate on the principle of electricity, including magnetism. So classification by use, performance and control. So you have instruments that are used for performance and instruments that are used for control. Control mean like for attitude indicator, altimeter, um, vertical speed indicator. And for control, for performance, you have engine instruments, cylinder head temperature gauge. You have a uh, press, uh, um, pressure gauge. You have engine in instruments are classified in two major ways, control and performance. Control mean, you know, when you pitch the aircraft up and pitch it down using the attitude indicator, altimeter, you know what IQ are, Air speed in, um, you know what IQ or the vertical speed indicator, you know what amount of pitch up or pitch down. For, for performance, you want to monitor the engine. So you look at the engine gauges, um, fuel, you want to look at engine temperature, engine pressure, and so on and so forth. Then we have uh, air speed indicator, of course, give you the speed of the aircraft, turn and slip indicator that will tell you what your 
if your bank is, if you are banking, making a coordinated turn, vertical velocity indicator. Okay, hang on a second. I don't know why you're not seeing me. Um, let's on a second. Let me correct this. Um, Why I'm not seeing my picture coming up here. Oh, sorry. All right, there you go. There it is, okay. Sorry about that technical glitch. Okay, so the airspeed indicator will give you the speed of the aircraft. And I just wanna run these down. The turn and slip just tell you how your turns are coordinated. If you're making a coordinated turn with the ailerons and rudder, you don't wanna be turning and you have an, an adverse yaw which the nose is over there, you're turning, but the nose is over there and the aircraft is moving there. Um, the vertical velocity indicator tells you your rate of climb. If you're climbing at 500 feet per minute, 1,000 feet per minute, same thing when you're descending. The attitude indicator tells you your degree of pitch. If you're pitching up five degrees, 10 degrees, or if you're pitching down um, five degrees, 10 degrees below the horizon, above the horizon. And of course, navigational instruments are used to help you to navigate from one point to the other. Like for example, a VOR, um, VHF, very high frequency omni range, or using what is called a, a, a automatic direction finder, or in or modern terms, you are using a flight management system or GPS. The most important navigation instrument is the magnetic compass, which is found in every aircraft, no matter how modern it is, you will find a compass, okay? Most planes have a heading indicator, which is a gyro instrument, which really um, will give you direction based on the compass. So you have to set it like every 15 minutes more, most modern day um, heading indicator, you don't really have to set it, but for like the smaller aircraft, it recesses. So you have to set it every 15 minutes so that it's saying the same degrees heading as the compass. So you look on the compass and then you set the heading indicator the same degree. So if the compass is saying 90 degrees, 090 degrees east, you set that heading indicator 090 degrees east. But every 15 minutes, you have to go back and try to set it. Some new concepts that were developed in aviation, the vertical shot, field takeoff and landing, which a typical example is the Aria jet. Another one is what, the F-35, David, or the F-22? I think it's the F-22. F-35. F-35, right. Yeah. They, they can take off from off the deck of an aircraft carrier or on surface vertically and go horizontally. And land, and land just the same way. Um, you have the a tilt rotor, helicopter as well that can do the same. Okay, so I'll just uh, read these down the line, um, John. I'll just ask you two questions to test your um, understanding. I won't post them up there because I don't want you to see the answers. <laughs> um, just listen to me carefully. I can put the questions there if you'd like. Um, let's try that. No. Or Trevor, if you want, I can paste them in for the Yes, David. Chat. Go ahead and paste them in for me. Okay, let me do and that. One second. I'll ask John to test his super knowledge. Okay, here it comes. <laughs> Oops, oh, sorry. you and I are going to go along just fine. <laughs> Hold on, sorry, that didn't work. One moment. Maurice, you're there or you, you left already? I just came back. Just in time for the quiz, and I'm sorry about that. Mo many apologies. And now I'm having trouble things. pasting it into the quiz. <laughs> Trevor, I think you might just want to do it um, orally here. Okay, so let's go with the first one. And this is like an open uh, question. All right, so we have uh, the dash axis runs from the tip of the nose to the tip of the tail of the single engine airplane. So we have elevator, Elevate, elevation, which should be elevator, lateral, longitudinal, and vertical, which is it? So it runs from the nose of the aircraft. 
we're talking about the role, correct? You tell me. I'm asking. Now, this is what I think, and that would be longitudinal. Correct. That's correct. So that's a good understanding there. All right. So, Maurice, I don't know if you want to attempt this one. I'll try it. I was there for that part. I hope. I, uh, Where uh, is the central area of a reciprocating engine? where fuel is converted into energy. That's kind of a kind of tricky one, but if you if you make an attempt at it, you might be able to answer it. Okay, um, I'm gonna try um, intake manifold. Uh, intake manifold, interesting. Uh, no, not quite. Um, John, you wanna give that a shot? Cylinder. All right, correct, cylinder. So, and that is why I say it's kind of tricky. Um, the central area of a reciprocating engine, remember what the reciprocate, reciprocating engine is all about. It has oh, four yeah. strokes, intake, compression, power, exhaust. So the fuel is introduced into the cylinder along with the air so that it can be compressed and ignite and create that explosion. Okay, I'll attempt one more. Um, which of the following is not one of the four basic types of turbine engines. Turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, turborod. That one should be easy. That one's for me? Uh, yes, John, that's for you. Turborod. Turborod, right, it's process of elimination. All right, great. I'll give one more to... Uh, I'll try it. Major Constantino, which of the following are protrusions from the leading edge of a wing? Flaps, rudders, slats, or spoilers? Slats. All right, there you go. You guys are very brilliant. So you show a high level of understanding of the content. So let's move to chapter nine. I'm gonna move through this quickly because I wanna David to start the next portion of the presentation. So. Um, just bear with me as I move through this quickly. And I'll just uh, skip the objectives and move down to the uh, main part of the lesson. So we're going to be looking at maps and projections. So this part of the lecture is looking at flight navigation. So flight navigation, which is pretty much, you know, everybody probably can relate to that at some point in time, has to do with maps and map projection. It has to do with how you travel from one point to the other. You, in, 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 in aviation, we talk about um, navigating by uh, VFR, visual flight rule, by flying and looking outside, you pick a point in front of you, you fly to that straight to that point, you pick another point, you, you fly straight to that point. Then you have what is called dead reckoning, where you have to make some kind of predetermined calculations. So to fly from point A to fly point B, you got to determine your course, your true heading, your magnetic heading, you got to look at the wind. You have, you have to calculate the ground speed to see based on where the wind is going and how much time it will take you to fly from point A to point B. So that's what they call dead reckoning. Now, just to backtrack a little bit. So let's look at the maps and map projections. Now, you know the Earth is a sphere and there are several lines that are being created. Parallel lines, longitude, I should say lateral lines, you know, par, um, longitudinal lines, and they all run at different points. So from the North Pole to the South Pole, from Greenwich to East is the longitudinal lines. And then from the equator, 90 degrees to the North, 90 degrees to the South, you have what? The latitudinal lines, okay? So they run from the equator, stack upward, smaller and smaller to the north, and from the equators, 
goes down to the South Pole. <clears throat> so the starting point of lines of longitudinal starts from zero. And for the longitudinal line, is North Pole to the South Pole from Greenwich. So east of Greenwich, you start counting zero to 180. And then for, uh, as I indicated, for the lateral lines from the equator North and South. So you have different types of maps that are being designed, but they take different types of design technique. You have the Mercator and you have the conic projections. And the Mercator is really a cylindrical projection of a map. So you can, you know, like you roll a paper up in a cylindrical form, that's what they call Mercator, but it's not accurate. If you look at the conic projection, the conic projection takes the form of the earth, the, the curvature of the earth. So if you form a cone, which has more curvature, it gives you a real life representation of what the earth looks like. And that gives you a better form of navigation. So one is cylindrical, the Mercator is more cylindrical and the, the conic projection is more like a cone. It takes the shape of the earth. The one is more accurate than the other. Section aeronautical charts. Most commonly used aeronautical chart for sectional chart. And for those of you who have been through like the scanner course and so on, and right behind you, John, that beautiful chart there is called a sectional chart, okay? And we use that for VFR navigation, okay? So that's one form. And on that chart, you have relief. And relief really, and so David showing you that sectional chart, relief really show you the rise and fall of the ground. How hilly or low is the ground? That's what relief is. Hydrographic features refer to like water, like a pond, a lake, etc. Cities, small um, cities, towns, things that you, you can use as landmarks on a sectional chart, airport, civilian, military, you know, controlled airspace on that sectional chart, you can find class D airspace, class C, class B airspace, and they're all indicated by different color and dashes, you know, in class B, the little H dash lines, class B, C, like a solid, solid um, line. Airways. Now, airways are like imaginary lines that aircraft use to navigate through the air. And they have different names like uh, J-45, B-210. But they are all like magnetic edits that are there from off a compass rose that the airplane will follow. So each jumbo jet that you see flying around they are really following a track. They are really following an airway. And that's what they use to fly from one point to another. Whether that airway goes to another navigational aid like a VOR or a ADF. ADF is outdated, more like VOR. So you put that particular frequency in the navigation instrument, instrument on the flight panel. You tune and identify. And then you have a VOR instrument, an omni bearing selector that you select that particular bearing and you intercept it and you track to it. Nowadays, we mostly use aero navigation, RNAV. We use GPS because we're moving away from VOR, ground based navigation system. Of course, when you talk about basic navigation, you talk about true course, a line or a series of lines that you can navigate by, which if you have a chart, you can draw a course, which represents the true course. And then you have the magnetic course, which is different from true north because of the magnetic north and the south pole. And that's just because of the magnetic effect of the earth, the north pole, the south pole. Compass deviation occurs once the compass is mounted in airplane, it must be adjusted because of disturbances. So the compass may be disturbed by electrical 
energy inside the aircraft, other electrical magnetic fields that are affecting the compass. So you have what is called compass deviation. The altimeter is a non-electronic instrument which really gives you the height above the ground or sea level. True airspeed, it really tells you the true speed of the aircraft moving through the air. Ground speed is really tells you the speed of the aircraft over the ground. So you have true airspeed, the speed as the aircraft move through the air, and you have ground speed, the aircraft moves over the ground, the speed of the aircraft moves over the ground. Then you also have indicated airspeed. That's what is showing inside the cockpit on the airspeed indicator, how fast the aircraft is traveling. And of course, you can use all those um, navigational principles and you can use the wind and you form what is called a wind triangle. In earlier times, when I started flying back in the day in the 90s, we, we had us to draw results on vectors. We had to draw a vector and we have to use the ground speed to get the ground speed. We have to use the wind and the wind speed. We have to draw the true course to get the true heading and we form a triangle to get the ground speed and the true air speed. Now it's different. We have GPS and so on, which is more modern. You can just plug the information in and we get from, it's calculated for us. We get from point A to point B, tells us what time we're gonna get there. Navigation techniques, as I mentioned to you before, you have two types, pilotage, which means, you know, you're flying VFR in reference to landmarks and then dead reckoning, you are taking into consideration all those factors, wind, true course, magnetic course, magnetic heading, ground speed, to calculate, to determine what time you get to a particular place flying from point A to point B. Electronic aids, the aircraft radio, as I mentioned to you for, before, you have electronic navigation for like VORs, um, ADF, um, and those are very useful navigation aids that we used prominently nowadays, but we are now moving away from to GPS-based navigation. Very high frequency omni range, that's what they call VORs. Um, we also have uh, distance measuring equipment, DME. So if you're tracking in towards the airport or navigational aid, it will tell you what the distance is to that aid. Whether you are 10 miles, five miles, 20 miles, 50 miles away from um, that station. And, and then you have different types of VOR. I won't get into that. Each VORs, and you have high altitude VORs, you have low altitude VORs, and you have mid range. Long range navigation, which is called LORAN, if you have heard that before. You have uh, GPS, global position systems, which we talk about a lot. We have PPS, precise, precise position system and standard position system. We have RNAV, which I already talked about in terms of one of the most common type of navigation that we're, we are using now, moving away from VOR navigation is, is, is RNAV, sorry, RNAV um, era navigation, satellite-based GPS navigation, landing navigation system. We have things like instrument landing system, we have microwave landing system. And uh, those are precise navigation system where if you can, you can put them in like categories, you have uh, precision approaches, which uses the ILS instrument landing system, which gives you uh, a glide slope and a course, a localizer course that you wanna have them cross right in the middle. And once you're cross right in the middle, you are on that glide slope three degrees coming down. Then you have microwave landing system, which also use uh, our precision radar navigation system. Then you have global position system, which of course give you a, a, a course that you track and you can put it on autopilot and it gets you to where you want to go at a particular height and distance. All right, so that comes Before you start to the, the quiz, Trevor, I just have a quick note I wanted to add. Yes. Um, for the microwave landing system, there was one very famous microwave system that was used in this country up until a few years ago. 
can anyone name what purpose that particular microwave landing system was used for? Any, does anyone have any ideas? What was that system used with? Anyone? I could take a guess, but I don't know for sure. Sure, take a guess. I was thinking the shuttle. Did the space shuttle use that? You are correct, sir. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, the space shuttle depended on the microwave landing system. And the reason why they used it is because the microwave landing system, unlike an ILS, does not require a straight in approach to the runway. An MLS can be used with a circular approach, which was exactly what the space shuttle uses. Um, every time it comes in for a landing, it uses the conical, uh, I forgot what it's called, the conical cylinder or something like that, um, right before landing. And in order to keep the heading properly set on the turn, they use the MLS system. So that was uh, a very famous usage. I mean, it is used in Europe more prominently than it is used here. Um, but for, for us over here in America, the space shuttle used it for decades and it worked every time. So <laughs> it was an interesting uh, system. Unfortunately, uh, it is going away, but uh, in its time, it was quite well used and very successful. Thank you, David. And um, yes, that's true because I've, I've, I've seen that myself. It follows like a curvature track and, you know, sometimes the uh, shuttle has to make different turns like s turns exactly drop down because it's not coming down with any propulsion it's just pitched to get a certain airspeed and you track in with that airspeed at different um different uh checkpoints mm -hmm. and it should be at certain altitude at different points and the ILS is similar to that except that once you establish like on a course inbound you start acquire the localizer first, which is the track, and then you acquire the glide slope. So once you intercept both of them and keep that needle centered, you follow that track right down to landing. And that is what, why it is called a, a precision approach. And then you have what is called non-precision approach, which you can also use a VOR, GPS, um, to track a course inbound at a particular altitude to arrive at a particular point. And you have other types as well. Um, we talk about air navigation. Those are non-precision. Then if you talk about more precise systems, like he talks about microwave, uh, precision, precision approach, radar, precision radar approach, you talk about LPV, localizer performance, vertical performance approach, where these are new things that are introduced by the FAA. They are there in the market already, but they, we are leaning more towards those kind of navigation and away from VOR types of navigation, non-precision, to more towards more um, um, precision approach. All right, uh, Trevor. So, Trevor, the um, at the at the um, uh, Air Power Museum, you know, there's a simulator, and that simulator, when you're on your approach, uses the lights as you're landing and you have, and the lights will go, the lights will turn if you're on the path or not. Right, that's called um, visual approach slope indicator. And you also have precision approach. Um, is, it, is, that under, is that under precision approach? Is that under that heading? No, well, all airport, all, I should say instrument airports will have VASI, which is called visual approach slope indicator and PAPI. So what we have precision path indicator, precision approach path indicator. So that is a part of the instrument system, but not tied into the instrument system. It's more of a visual reference. So when mm -hmm. the pilot sees like a VSI, you will see a red and green, for example, or red and white. Red and white, right. He will, he will ease on, ease on path, ease on track. But if you are high, you will see two white, 
if you're too low, you're going to see too red. For the puppy, it's a little bit, it's more lights. Like you may have two red, two white, and you might have three red, one white, two white, one red. Mm -hmm, and it mm -hmm. means that you're a little bit too high above the glide slope or a little bit too low. And if you see four red, you are too low. Too low. If yeah. you see four whites, you are really high. So it's really to give a visual indication to the pilot. So when he comes down and you know comes down to what is called the minimum descent altitude or the decision altitude or decision height, and he's flying that aircraft by hand, not autopilot, which they can also do, it's also a guide to help them to land precisely. You can control the pitch and power by by um, following look at looking at the lights. But in in more um, instrument flight rule where, where the weather is very bad, you sometimes unable to see those lights clearly. Mm -hmm. So you have to rely on your navigational instruments like your um, um, uh, uh, what do you call it now um, precision approach instruments, glide slope localizer. Okay. And you don't use the localizer like the VOR non-precision for to come in where the weather is bad. You don't do that because you are much, the MDA is much higher, like 500 feet versus the ILS, which is about 200 something feet, hmm. which is more precise. But they still do have approaches that are VORs and most airports have both VOR, ILS, and also air navigation. And as I said to you before, air navigation, RNAV is taking over. It, it's, it's more pronounced, it's more usable in navigation now. RNAV, um, LPV, localizer, um, uh, localizer performance approach. The, which are coupled to satellites like, you know, wide ear augmentation system, um, you know, RAM. So those things are there to make it uh, more efficient and more precise type of navigation mm -hmm. system. All right, so let's take a few questions. Let's answer a few questions, take a few um, questions, and then I'll hand it over to David. So, I think okay. I can paste this one in. Hold on one second. Let me try uh, if I can paste this for you. Let me try one second. Okay, it's in the chat window. Question number one. So on a map, parallel lines are called lines off. C is correct. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I should answer that. C is correct. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Next one, David. Next one. Number two. Leave that to John. I'll, I'll answer it. Um, <laughs> B, B, Greenwich. <laughs> that is correct. Okay. All right. Great, guys. Any Here's questions? Number, number three. Want me to do that one? Hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little stuck. I I'm gonna. I'm pick stuck one. on that. I'm stuck on that too. Rise and fall of the terrain. What is that? Rise and fall. I I was gonna go relief, but I'm a little not. I don't know about conic. I'm not sure what that is. It's relief, huh? I see a thumbs up, Dave. All right. Good job. I remember you all. You also have contours which give you different elevation of like a mountain. You can look on the map where the lines are joined closely. You know that the terrain is steeper. If the lines are spread out, it's, it's less steep, like isogonic lines, you know? Um, all right, any questions? Yeah, I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to think of a vector. I'm trying to think of a vector map. I mean, I, I have to use that for drone work, what's behind me. And I'm trying to figure out, um, that would that would that live on a vector map or no? That would be only ge geographical. What 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 are you asking exactly? You're talking about how to describe uh, use uh, what terms to use describe elevations on maps. Okay? Oh right. So which so, elevations on maps are called reliefs. 
Right, now in elevations on a vector, it shows you elevations. It shows you AGL and MSL. Right, so you are right. above ground level. That means you're measuring the height above the ground. Right. In terms of altitude. And then sea level. And then you have sea level. level. You're measuring the height above sea level. Where does so bring level this at? bring this home for me, Trevor. Bring this home, right? <laughs> with 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 you know with that question. How do I relate what we just talked about to that question? Okay. On a vector map. So for map. example, if on I a vector ask, map. if I ask you, and, and I'm trying to understand it clearly myself too. Um, okay. your question. So if I ask you, um John, I want you to. Let, let's say, for example, you could see the altitude of your drone, or let's say you're in an aircraft, and I said, I want you to fly, let's backtrack a little. Let's say the sea level elevation, that means the elevation of the land above the sea is 50 feet, okay? And I said, John, what is the ground, what is the AGL? above the ground. Uh, let me and just real, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold okay. on. Let me talk because I want you to get this real simple. If yeah. I ask you, what is the altitude? What is the MSL, mean sea level altitude? Right. And you're flying at a thousand feet. What would be that altitude? And I said the elevation, the sea level elevation is 50 feet. What would be the total altitude? Not 950. Uh, for the MSL. Oh, for MS, oh, for MSL. Wow, it's, it, it MSL is a, is a thousand feet. Plus 50. Plus, plus 50. Right. right. You'd say I got that, I got that question wrong. I, in, 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 in the tests I'm taking, I got it wrong the first right. time. And I'm get, still getting it wrong. <laughs> so you got to remember, you got to make it inclusive. Sea level right. is all the altitude from sea level to where you're at. Now let's look at above ground level. Gro above ground level is the height above the ground. Right. So what would be the height above the ground if you're flying at a thousand feet? Remember we talk about 50 feet MSL plus a thousand, give you a thousand fifty for the mean sea level. So if I ask you, what is the height above the ground with respect to that what would be the height or the altitude if we're talking agl it'd be 50, agl 50 feet no uh, no the height would be thousand feet because you're you're excluding the sea level height you're ex okay so you're excluding the sea level height so, so if you're where, in wherever you're flying wherever that height is above the ground is what you call above ground level. Right, AGL. I, that's what I'm trying to, you know, I see it on a map. I understand it because I memorized it, okay? But I still don't understand it. And that's where I'm, it's funny that I don't want to, this is a discussion later on. I don't want to take you guys But, but, but I want you, I want you to grasp it stuck. because you're going to come up on this question again. Yeah. So think of it this way. Um, whenever you're flying, you have in the altimeter you have a Coleman window that you have to set a pressure yeah. so the pressure might be 29.92 inches of mercury which is standard so yeah. you're setting that pressure based and that will give you where what is the elevation of the airport and you get that from what is called automatic terminal information system mm -hmm. where you'll get an atis and it will tell you what the wind is 350 at 10 knots it will tell you what the temperature dew point it will tell you what the, the pressure is. So you put that pressure in the Coleman window. And where you are at the time of day, time of temperature, pressure, and density, it will give you the true elevation of where you are. And all that- From the ground or, or from the, the sea level? While you're on the ground, you, you can set it on the ground as well as in the air when you're coming into land. Okay. So, but the point I want to drive across is this. Once you set the mean sea level, let's, let's say the elevation of this airport is 50 feet. So when you put that barometric pressure in the Coleman window in the altimeter, let's say it gives you 50 feet. You're on the airport surface, you read it out, it says 50 feet on the altimeter. 
you get up, you start flying, you, are, you want to go up to 1,000 feet. So you fly up to 1,000 feet, so that would be what? 1,000 feet plus 50. 50, right. Or if you want to say the 50 is included in the 1,000 feet, but the total altitude above sea level would be what? 1,000 feet. Right. Now, if 1,050, sorry, 1,050, no, okay. because you already right. set the 50, the, the 50 is already indicated on the, the altimeter in the Kozman window, and, and the altimeter is indicating 50, so it's 1,050. Right. Right, right. So you are flying above the ground. So what would be your altitude above ground level? Your it, altitude, how much? It would be, it would be 1050, uh, at the, based on what you're saying, correct? No, above ground level. Oh, would 50 ground. feet. 50, it'd be 50 feet. No, no, it's not going to be 50. Because yeah, remember, that's what, remember see, you're, you're telling me ab above ground level is 50 feet, and then you're asking me, what is the no, no, above no. ground? Let's That's where I get a little bit. Let's, let's backtrack a little bit because there's one part that you're missing out of. Obviously. When you're on the ground. And Sorry, Maurice. No, it's can, fine. I'm, I'm, like I said, ground, I'm loving this. You know what the altimeter looks like, right? Yeah. You know that little window called the Kozman window? No. Have you ever heard the 80s before? Not really. All right. The 80s is automatic terminal information system. It gives you a bunch of information like um, the dates, what alphabetical code they are using for that hour. It gives you the wind, the wind speed, temperature dew point. It gives you <clears throat> cloud information, visibility, and it also gives you the barometric pressure. So for every location as a particular pressure, that at the time of that particular time, the airport, that instruments measure the temperature, density pressure, and it says 29.92 inches of mercury. Mm -hmm. Let's say you put that in the Kozman window, 2992. And when you look at the altimeter, before you leave the ground, it is saying 50 feet. Okay. So that particular time, it is saying 50 feet above sea level. Above sea level. Okay. Right. So you have not taken off yet. When you take off, because remember, the altimeter already showing you 50 feet. Right. But when you take off, now that 1,000 feet that is there, that the altimeter is showing, it is showing you 1,000 feet above what? Mean sea level. Because right. you are already taking into consideration that 50 feet that it is already showing on the ground. Right. So it would be a thousand feet, correct? The mean sea level is a thousand feet. Right, a thousand feet above mean sea level. Right, but so, I'm already fifty feet above sea level, right? Right. Okay, I'm already above fifty feet of sea right. level before correct? you take off. Before you take off, right? Right. Right. So when you take off now, you're at a thousand feet, and I, I should correct myself on that too. And you're at a thousand feet. How much? would be above ground level. What are you going to do with that 50 feet? See, uh, this is where I get confused. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on, saying hold on. Add it, but I would, I don't, for me, my mind's saying subtract it. Right, I don't know that's correct. That's why I said I corrected right. myself. You oh. have to subtract it. Subtract it, yes. Right, so your altitude would be what? Above ground level. How much above, above ground level? Up would be, would be nine. Would you say it? You say one thousand fifty? No. No, that's incorrect. No, that's incorrect. That's right. Okay, nine fifty. That's what 950, I would say. Right, right. right. Nine fifty. Right. I, I corrected myself. I see. That would I be nine fifty. Right. That makes that makes total sense to me. Right. Yeah. So it would be nine fifty. So, but the point I was getting at is you're measuring the height above the ground. That's AGL. And yeah. MXL is height above sea level. Sea level. Right. And that is why every time you're landing. You got to put that in your altimeter so it gives you the correct altitude because you have to take into consideration that elevation at the airport because you don't want to come down and you have zero. Let's say you have a thousand feet flat out. You did not put in that 50 feet and you're coming down 
boom, you slam into 50 feet of elevation instead right. of you say, oh, okay, zero. Because you're right. saying in your that head, makes oh, sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. So you got to be real careful. Then when yeah. do you add it? When do you add? So when the answer is 1050, when would you ever add it? Is it the opposite question? Well, once you have the MSL in there yeah. and you want to find it, AGL, you have to subtract the elevation. Right, you but when do you add it? When do you add you, the elevation? You add, it, you, you add it when you know the sea level. If you know the sea uh, level, if you know uh, the sea level, and uh, they will tell you, okay, you're descending from, let's say, a two thousand feet to one thousand feet, and your elevation is fifty feet. You're moving from two thousand to one thousand, so you got a minus that 50 feet because you have an elevation of 50 feet right to get the agl so to get the msl you have to add it ah that's the difference so when you're getting msl you add it when you get agl you subtract it is that All basically right. Right. All right. now that 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 helped a lot right so and i gotta look for those i gotta look for those words on that test but read that'll the be on the, carefully that's on the 107 test read the question down. carefully Read yeah. the question carefully. Yeah. The, the FAA um, they on the uh, on the sectional chart, it shows graphically uh, by color what the elevations are of the terrain. So if you're looking on a, a vector map, just go by the color. It'll indicate uh, how high certain areas are, and uh, it'll give you the information for the largest um, area in that mm -hmm. section. Like this number will indicate the tallest point in that grid. In that so okay. as you look through yeah. the sectional chart, you'll see those numbers. And yeah. depending on what's in it, you'll see uh, the numbers go up or down. And that's also an MSL number. Which is also yes, called- that's right. That's right. Off, it is MSL. Which is okay. also called off-road obstruction clearance altitude. It's really giving it, telling you there are, there are obstructions, mountainous obstructions out there that you got to look out for when you're flying. Because you could be flying at a thousand feet, but there is yeah. a mountain that is 850. And you might think that you will clear that mountain with a thousand feet when you might end up slamming into it because the elevation might be 150 and the mountain is, a, is 850, that's a thousand feet. Mm. So you gotta be real careful, um, but there are rules to govern those kind of flying. For a mountainous area, for IFR, you should clear it by a 2000 feet. For non-mountainous, it's 1000 feet. So those are things that you got to take into consideration. I do not want to hold on it on tweet anymore. No, no, no. It's time to go on that. But here it is, Dave. I got it right here. Okay, cool. <laughs> You're set. Yeah. All right. So um, I you ask showed a <laughs> same thing. Uh, yeah, go ahead. It's a vector map. I'm not familiar with that. Well, you could look at it. Uh, you know, sky vector. I think oh. is what John is referring to. And, and that's where I got this from. From sky vector, actually. Oh, yeah. okay. Got it. Okay. Okay, David. Um, if there are no more questions, thank you guys for no, listening. Let me ask Up to chapter Up 10. To this is now uh, we're entering part three, which is the aerospace community. And we will start with talking about the airport, the airport itself, yeah. uh, which as most people are familiar with, um, it's where we go when we want to go somewhere pretty far. So uh, let's get into it. The different parts of the airport. We'll start with the runway, which is kind of important for the airplanes that are using it. Uh, runway is basically the area that airplanes use for takeoff and landing. And they're all identified by a, a certain number. Um, I didn't know this when I was younger, but those numbers are important. They mean certain things. Uh, specifically the alignment based on the magnetic compass of how that uh, runway is oriented. Uh, we use the first two digits of the compass direction rounded off to the nearest 10 degrees. And uh, that is what determines the uh, numbering system for each runway. Uh, obviously one end is going to be 180 degrees opposite of the other end. 
So you just take the reciprocal heading number to figure that out. Uh, but it's also on the uh, airport charts, which are downloadable. Um, let's see, what else can we talk about with those numbers? Oh, this is also interesting. Uh, due to the Earth's magnetic uh, poles shifting, those numbers will change over time. There are airports that periodically will have to renumber their runways just yeah, because the earth is changing. So uh, the way they were oriented when they were built may not match the uh, compass heading today. So uh, periodically, every few years, some airports do have to uh, renumber. And that's why it's a good idea to uh, check your airport charts before uh, doing your flight planning and make sure that uh, the runway number that you're expecting is still the one that uh, they have in place. So that's, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Okay, uh, taxiways. Taxiways are the basically the roads that aircraft use to get to and from the runways. And uh, each one has usually a letter or a combination of letters, possibly some numbers. Um, and each airport is gonna be different as far as their layout and their pattern. Um, you will also find ramps and hangars on the airport. Uh, that's where aircraft are parked um, in between flights. Um, you also have at some airports, you will have a control tower and uh, that's where ATC will give their instructions from to aircraft that are using the facilities. Uh, uncontrolled airports are those that do not have a physical tower on the premises and um, pilots using those facilities have to use the radio for uh, the airport, but they're not going to be talking to a tower per se. They will be talking on the common traffic frequencies, uh, making sure that uh, they stay separated properly and safely from other aircraft that are using that facility. And also, that's to each other, right, Dave? To each other. Correct. And okay. uh, you may also be talking to air traffic control at another location. Uh, if you're transiting through a, a section, uh, you may need to be talking to someone, but it won't be at that facility. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's, again, that's getting off topic, but uh, yes. <laughs> so speaking of other facilities, um, there are certain services that pilots can use, one of which is the National Weather Service, and they provide weather information to flight service stations. Those are depicted on sectional charts as well, plus um, you'll see them um, if you're looking for airport charts, um, you'll find those listed along with the frequencies that pilots can use to uh, check in with them if they need some assistance in getting somewhere, they can get weather reports uh, en route. And uh, if something is going on, uh, let's say in terms of military uh, operating areas, Flight service stations can often alert pilots to uh, whether they're hot, whether they're cold, or if there's a certain TFR happening, uh, they may have the time information when those are live and when pilots need to be uh, not in the same place. <laughs> so next we have uh, beacons. Airports do have beacons that uh, indicate different things. You'll often see the red ones, those are uh, for low visibility uh, airplanes that are approaching the area. If you see a red light, that means you're getting pretty low. Um, you'll also have the rotating aircraft, I'm sorry, the rotating uh, airport beacon, which at most general aviation facilities is gonna be a green and white uh, light. That'll rotate uh, at night and also in, in times of low visibility, uh, fog or other conditions like that. Military uses their own. Um, they do it a little bit differently. They have a white light that splits into two beams and it looks like it's a green flash followed by two quick white flashes. So those are the beacons. It helps if you're uh, coming into the area and you're trying to pick out an airport and with all the ground clutter and lights that are happening, it's very hard to pick out the airport. But once you see that, uh, that beacon flashing, then it's, it's a pretty good idea that you're looking at an airport down there, whether it's the right one you're looking for, that's a different question. 
but you'll you'll be able to identify based on the color and the flashes. So that's uh, it's a very important thing um, at night and in low visibility weather. So what are airport concerns and challenges? One of which would be wildlife. We have um, wild animals that sometimes get onto the airport premises, uh, mostly birds. Uh, nobody checks with them. They uh, come and go as they want. And uh, it's a dangerous thing. So as we've seen uh, in the past, bird strikes are a big deal. Um, Miracle on the Hudson, perfect example. Uh, that, was, that was a lucky situation, uh, very fortunate, no loss of life, but bird strikes took out both engines. Airplane was flown to a safe landing on the Hudson River, but uh, we do have to be vigilant at all times. You just don't know, uh, birds can come out of nowhere and uh, hopefully there's a report, uh, either a pilot will file a report or the tower itself will alert pilots to uh, birds in the vicinity. And we just have to be very careful about that. Another area of concern is noise. And uh, this is kind of a funny one for me because you'll often hear uh, neighborhoods file complaints with the FAA, how dare the airplanes fly so low and constantly at night and blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, I'm wondering, the airport was there decades before you arrived. Why are you complaining are you that moving? they are so noisy? Uh, but okay, that's again, that's getting off topic. Uh, it is a concern and there are noise abatement procedures that pilots will follow. Uh, those are on the charts, uh, depending on the departure type. Uh, airplanes will pull back on the power uh, just after takeoff. And that is to accommodate uh, the general public. Uh, pilots do want to be good citizens, and uh, we try our best to uh, do as well as we can with the neighbors. Uh, it's just a fact of life. The airports are going to be noisy. OK, so let's get into uh, the quiz. I'm going to try and paste uh, a question. And let me get that in the window, in the chat window. Anyone want to take that first one? Uh, white. White is correct. Very good. Okay, let me get number two up. Here comes number two. This might be a little bit tricky. I didn't mention this. <laughs> Most of my diagram. That's an odd one. Yeah, that's. I'll I, go parallel, but I'm guessing. Uh, you are correct. I. I don't like that question, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> it's ambiguous. <laughs> I think the question would have been better if it was discussing runways, uh, because we yeah. often see airports with parallel runways. Yeah. Um, the taxiway itself being parallel, it's not really no. an issue. It's not uh, not as critical. Um, the only time it may come in as a as a hazard is, uh, and this has happened recently, where an aircraft is lining up for a given runway and maybe due to lighting or weather conditions, the pilot accidentally spots the taxiway that is running parallel. And there have been some near misses where uh, they've come close to landing on the taxiway. And in fact, in some cases they have done that. Uh, it is very difficult to tell. Um, when there are parallel taxiways and runways together. Um, that has happened at San Francisco International. Uh, there was a near miss over there. And it, it happens at other airports too. And one of the ways they mitigate that is um, the taxiway often will have um, large letters that are painted on the surface that say taxiway. So in visual conditions, a pilot will hopefully see that in time and realize that they are not lined up properly with the runway and hopefully they have enough time to adjust or go around. So that would be one, uh, one particular. Dave, I don't even understand how you could make that mistake unless it's bad weather and you have no instruments. Believe it or not, there wow. are some pilots with thousands of hours who have done just that. And, wow, um, of course. Even Air Force C, uh, it can happen. <laughs> a C, I, I would call it now, 17 lands on a taxiway. You can research that one. That's for real. <laughs> yeah. There was this, uh, an actor, I forget his name. Harrison Ford did that. Thank you. 
<laughs> he's he's a good pilot. That's yeah, multi that's the scary thousand hour thing. pilot. Yeah, he's uh, he's been an advocate for flying, and uh, he's a good pilot. But he's human. We all are, and he made that mistake, and uh, we learn from it. That's that's really the key here. Is uh, when mistakes like that do occur, we try our best to. Uh, all right, accept it. We try not to let it happen again, but it helps other pilots learn. And all right, just like you said, you know, how could it happen? Well, here's a perfect example where uh, he did just that. Um, you can find that on Google as well. Um, but yeah, it's a learning. It has a lot of uh, videos on that and how, you know, how the visuals, it's very easy to make that. It's easier than you think to make that mistake. Absolutely. And especially um, under high workload situations, a pilot's trying to uh, keep the airplane stabilized, trying to make sure um, they're separated properly from other aircraft. And lo and behold, you know, where are they going? They're not exactly where they're supposed to be. So mm -hmm. certain things like that can obviously happen um, and it doesn't matter the experience level. We all have to just be vigilant, uh, whether we are the pilots or whether we're on the ground and we see something happening, we have to uh, alert someone that, uh, hey, you know, there's a, there's a hazard happening and uh, take appropriate actions. Or whether we're a part of a, a crew. Exactly, yeah. yes, uh, for Civil Air Patrol, uh, that's, that's exactly right, we have to, uh, always have our eyes out the window, no matter whether we're pilot, mission pilots or observers or scanners, we are all part of the same team. We have to be uh, watching out and hey, if something doesn't look right, alert the pilot and say, hey, I don't know if that uh, is correct. And, you know, we have to put our egos aside. You know, it doesn't matter how many hours we each have. Uh, we are all there to help one another. And as part of that team, it's our responsibility uh, to uh, conduct a safe flight, and it doesn't we, matter. We again, call that, I'm, I'm, I'm going to question something. We call that crew resource management. Yes, is, is that the word that you guys use? That works. It's a part of crew resource management, um, but it's a part of the uh, briefing as well um, to see and avoid. And, and yeah. the pilot should discuss that before he gets off the ground during his briefing with the crew. You should, you know, explain that if you see something with 12 o'clock being in front of you, you point it out with the clock reference. So if you see something coming from a, if 12 o'clock is always in front of you, a reference of one o'clock, two o'clock, mm -hmm. point it out to the pilot, let him know what's going on. So everybody's a part of that. See and avoid. Cockpit resource management now is utilizing all the resources that you have, have available in the aircraft whether it may be air traffic control, or whether it may be GPS, whether it may be your uh, manuals, charts, whatever you have available that can help you to have a safe flight inside and outside the aircraft, that's what you use as your CRM. And, and what, we, what we count on is our visual observer in the, in, in the drone world. It's, it's under that resource management, the other, the other set of eyes out there. Right. Wherever, yeah, yeah. See and avoid. So, Cool. So just one, one additional point regarding CRM. Uh, the reason it actually came into being is unfortunately there was, an, there was a few accidents uh, due to the pilot and the first officer not communicating. And the reason for that is, okay, you have a, a long time pilot in command and you have perhaps a first officer who's just starting out in the industry they felt intimidated. They saw something was not right. And they felt, who am I to speak up? Who am I to say to the pilot, oh, uh, this, this doesn't look good. Not going to happen. Nobody is going to uh, question their pilot when they're in charge and uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, in fact, it's happened where the pilot themselves said it. Who are you to say uh, how I'm supposed to conduct my flight? <laughs> so unfortunately, there was uh, an incident, which I don't remember off the top of my head which specific one it was, where there was a fatal accident due to communication problems in the cockpit. And uh, the pilot and the, the first officer were not on the same page by any means at all. And uh, unfortunately, there was a crash that followed. So in the that investigation that followed, I'm sorry? 
is that flight over by California? I don't remember. There, there was there was a few in California. I'm not sure if that was the specific one. I'd have to look it up. I don't recall which they, one it was. They, they descended and crashed into the ground, and nobody was saying anything. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, it did happen. So in the investigation that followed, uh, the NTSB and the FAA realized there's an issue of communication uh, where, whether it's ego, whether it's experience or lack thereof, pilots and the air crew were not communicating in a successful manner. And they felt that accidents could definitely be reduced if everyone felt like they were on the same equal footing as anyone else, whether it was the pilot, the first officer, co-pilot, whoever, uh, they have to feel equal as far as conducting the safe operation of that aircraft. And the, new, the regulations were enacted that uh, CRM is a requirement. The sterile cockpit rule uh, also came out of uh, an accident where pilots were discussing things that were not related to the safe operation of the aircraft and they were distracted Neither one, the pilot or the first officer, was noticing the dangers that were occurring, and a fatal accident did occur. So uh, sterile cockpit rules now apply across the board in aviation. So this was something that, unfortunately, uh, we needed an accident to, uh, to gain the experience to realize we need to make changes. And safety is paramount. And uh, that means everyone has to be uh, in charge of that. It doesn't matter what level you're at, uh, whether you have one stripe on your epaulets or four, you are in that cockpit, you are responsible and everyone is allowed to speak up and say if they identify anything that is unsafe. So I, uh, I, I have an a quick example of that in the military. Now, I was not military, but this happened to my son in Afghanistan. He was one of the IED spotters. So he'd have to go in front of everybody and check for IEDs. He oh. found one. He found one. And he radios back to his lieutenant commander. And, um, uh, <laughs> the, and the procedure that the lieutenant commander said about face. And James, my son, gets on, who's a specialist one, says, um, Lieutenant, I just was at a, uh, I was schooled yesterday, as of yesterday, and they said it's not an about face because what the Taliban does is put the IEDs behind the troops. They want you to go back and um, uh, uh, about face. That's what they want you to do, and that's how they kill you. He said this over the radio, and, the, he, he, and this is what the commander said. Uh, Specialist, when you get my stripes, you can make the, you can make the call. And he said, about face. Immediately over the radio, some higher command said, listen to your specialist. He's right. So there was some, there was like, <laughs> and, and, and they, made a, they made a different decision. So wow. here, here is, this is a true life really happened in Afghanistan in the middle of a war. And that was clearly machoism. And, you know, that's the, pro there's a problem right there. Ego, machoism and all that. You know, and thank God somebody was listening and said, listen to your specialists. Yeah. So this can happen anywhere. This can happen no. in any kind of any kind of field. Uh, and when David. we're talking safety, we have to really honor what you just said, David. One, two, three, four, doesn't matter. Exactly. Be, be on alert. It's so true. It's so true. Okay. Thank you for that. That that had accord with me. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> All right. You're so, welcome. You're so, welcome. Let's, let's move along. Let's try to get uh, another chapter or two in if we can, if you're still able to. Okay. So we're going to talk about air carriers. Air carriers. What? No quiz? Uh, Sorry. Sorry about that. We did well enough there. We're, we're good. <laughs> So major air carriers, usually we're talking about airliners when we're talking about air carriers. So we have uh, modern airlines. Uh, unfortunately, some big names have come and gone. Uh, Pan Am comes to mind. Uh, they were around for decades. Uh, probably the first one, I believe. Uh, first big one for sure in this country. Um, we've seen 
TWA, Trans World Airlines, and uh, I have one of those actually. Eastern Airlines as well. Yes, yes, I have that. Eastern was very big back in the day. And uh, unfortunately, that's all based on economics and the, the change in times. Uh, sometimes even the bigger names can't, uh, can't sustain themselves. But uh, and you'll find sometimes the big names come back. Like uh, Eastern is an airline today. They are not the same as the, what, they, what they were. But uh, Eastern is still flying uh, different cities, but uh, they have aircraft flying under that banner now. So, okay, that's, that's one area. Uh, now, those are for passengers primarily. They will have cargo, uh, but there are also airlines that are 100% cargo. Um, one local one is Atlas. They fly out of JFK and they have uh, hubs all over the place. You'll see if you ever follow on let's say uh, flight radar, uh, you can follow their flights. Um, they go out to Alaska or Europe, wherever it is, and uh, you can follow along. So uh, again, that's getting off topic. Then we also have regional commuter aircraft. So some of the big names like American Airlines, they will have their regional um, cohorts and uh, American Eagle. They fly the shorter trips, uh, smaller aircraft, uh, but they all fit under the umbrellas of the big airlines. And we have the FAA, Federal Aviation Administration. They're the ones in charge of regulating the safety of all aircraft in this country. Um, Airline Deregulation Act of 19 1978 gave the airlines free entry into the air routes of the US. Um, I'm not gonna go into the details of that because uh, we're short on time. Um, modern airliners. Okay, so what are we talking about? Primarily big jets. So I did show uh, a little bit earlier. I have a few on hand. Uh, this happens to be a 787 Boeing uh, Dreamliner. This is considered one of the modern ones. Um, in the textbook, if you actually uh, do the reading. I mentioned earlier that uh, some of it is very dated. Uh, some of the models that they're listing here, for example, McDonnell Douglas DC-10, that's a three-engined wide-body jet. Uh, very few of those today still flying. Most of them, if not all of them, are still uh, in the air as cargo jets. Same thing with the follow-on to that model, which is the MD-11. And I have an example of that. So just for a little Trevor, bit, I love this guy. <laughs> I really do. Show and tell. <laughs> he, he's, 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 he has it all, man. So oh just a quick example. This is the DC-10, and this is the MD-11, which That's is cool. slightly longer, slightly lo uh, wider wi uh, wingspan. Um, unfortunately, those planes, like I said, are not really in active service for passengers. Why? Economics. Three engines. You're going to maintain three engines. Um, it's not as good as flying two engines because of the dollars required to keep all of those engines in service. Uh, today, technology has improved so much that uh, the Dreamliner, for example, behind me, it will fly farther faster and more fuel efficient than any three engine aircraft. So that's why uh, airlines are buying them. Uh, they're going with the twins. Um, and it's funny, I'm going down the list in the textbook. Again, a lot of it is no longer really current. So the Lockheed L-1011, which I don't have behind me, it's another wide body three engine jet. It was a competitor to the DC-10. And I do remember JFK had all of these aircraft flying in daily and uh, they were awesome to see. That was just from an aircraft nerd perspective, uh, wide body uh, three engine jets were quite the sight to see. Uh, TWA flew them, Delta flew them, um, Eastern flew them all the time. But again, times changed, economics really weren't in favor of keeping those birds in the air. So many of them are scrapped. And uh, I don't think there are any L-1011s in the US flying mm -hmm. regularly. 
Uh, same thing with Airbus. Uh, they had the A300, which was a phenomenal aircraft. It was mm -hmm. uh, released in the late 70s. It had an advanced wing design. Um, beautiful aircraft. American Airlines flew them. I was on one, um, but no longer. Uh, they've come out with the A310, A320s, 30s, 40s, now the 80s. So, okay, let's talk about bigger uh, bigger aircraft. We have A340 is a four engine aircraft, A380 is a four engine aircraft, and the uh, 747, which is the queen. So unfortunately, as we've seen, especially in the last year with the COVID restrictions uh, and airplanes not flying, many airlines have decided now's the time they're going to start retiring uh, the lesser efficient aircraft in their fleets. And unfortunately that does include A380s, 747s, and the Airbus A340. Those planes are either in storage now or they're scrapped. And it's just a matter of the economics. When you can have a two engine aircraft doing the same route, flying the same distance, same speed, or maybe faster with just the two engines, um, it's gonna win every time over the four engine jets. So unfortunately, uh, if you wanted to fly in a 747 on a US airline, you're out of luck. So you either need to go to Europe or uh, maybe see one at a museum. Um, we have also the smaller engine, uh, the smaller fuselage aircraft. We have uh, 737s, which I believe is the most popular Boeing ever produced. I think that's still correct. Uh, they are still in production. And aside from the recent issues with the 737 MAX aircraft, um, they are still very popular on the short haul routes and you'll see them everywhere. They've started with, uh, I believe I have one actually. Hold on one second. So this is an old model. Uh, this is the 737-200. And what's notable, at least for me, is the engines. They have the cigar pod shape to them. So back in the day, they were shaped like that for a very good reason. The aircraft sits low to the ground. There's no clearance to have a larger diameter engine. Mm. So that was Boeing's solution. Now, obviously times change, technology improved, and uh, they came out with the larger diameter uh, 300 model all the way up through the 800s and the 900s. And those engines of today are so fuel efficient that uh, these airplanes can go twice as far as they could uh, back when that, uh, when that example was flying. Uh, one other neat little uh, tidbit about the 200 model, if you ever sat in one on a flight and you watched the airplane landing, uh, the buckets on the back of that engine would flip open in a clamshell configuration. And that was worth the price of the flight right there just to see that happening. <laughs> so if you ever wanna see what that really looks like, um, there are a few YouTubes out there of the 737 with the reverse thrust. And uh, it's quite something to see. Um, but moving along, uh, we have cargo jets, as I mentioned briefly, uh, DC-10s, that's their primary role today is as a cargo carrier. Why? Because they're wide body. Uh, they can carry a lot of pallets and it's, even though it's three engines, yes, but it's more fuel, it's not fuel efficient, but it is more economical for airlines to fly cargo on those aircraft because they can carry way more uh, than if they were putting passengers into the fuselage. So you'll see those uh, still prominent. Uh, and then we have the mid-range jets. Uh, Boeing 757 has been an awesome workhorse for Boeing. Uh, but those are being phased out as well. They're getting kind of on the older side, the 767, same thing. They are still in use, but not as widespread. Uh, the big one really for Boeing at least is the 777. It's still, uh, still a workhorse. It's now 25 years old. Um, for me, the most interesting thing about the, the 777 is how it was developed. And uh, Boeing used that aircraft as their first one that was designed entirely on the computer using a CAD system, computer-aided design. 
and manufacturing. And uh, that was really the first modern aircraft to, uh, to go all computer, all digital, as far as the development was concerned. And they also learned a few things. Uh, not everything done on the computer is gonna work out perfectly the first try. They uh, had systems that they were designing. Engineers in one department made their systems. Engineers in another department made their systems. And when they put the 3D model together on the computer, they saw that, um, hmm, they're having some interference issues with uh, overlapping wiring, plumbing, et cetera, and it didn't work. They spent many, uh, many months trying to figure out how to isolate the systems on the computer, but because it was digital, the revisions that they went through was a lot faster. Um, so building on that experience, the more modern airliners, like the, the Dreamliner, for example, they used those lessons in the development and it went much faster for uh, the Dreamliner, which again, did have its own problems, but for other reasons. Um, but using the computer was one of the best things for aircraft manufacturers as far as how to develop an airplane in terms of designing the aerodynamics. They have computer modeling. Uh, you don't necessarily need the wind tunnel these days, although they still use them. Um, but a lot of that can be simulated on the computer and using 3D models. So um, that is one connection between the aviation world and the, di the digital tech world that we have today. So uh, as technology improves, aircraft manufacturing is also improving. Uh, whether you're talking about materials of the aircraft or the avionics themselves, it's, it's all been fascinating to follow. So moving along, I'm gonna skip over a few of these other uh, aircraft uh, European manufacturers. Yeah, there's some names that have been around for a while, but I don't wanna to get too bogged down with them. So let's get into the quiz on this. Uh, all right, let's go with number one. I'm gonna paste that in the window and whoever wants to feel free to uh, field that one. FAA. <laughs> you can't miss, right? Correct. <laughs> Uh, now, if you did answer A, Civil Aeronautics Board, that would have been correct, but it's no longer the name that's used. That, uh, that went away when the FAA came into being. So uh, it was correct early on in aviation. So, all right, number two coming up. And that could have two answers. Could be. <laughs> yeah. If anyone wants to try that one. A and B. That's what I would go with. Because they, they, they did use that for both. I, I remember but that. Again, see, that's, that's where the, uh, the outdated nature of the textbook is a little bit problematic. Because back when it was first written, DC-10s were not primarily cargo jets. So over time, that is what happened. And uh, I think it's a good thing that uh, they were able to repurpose many of them rather than sending them out to the scrapyard. They can still uh, fly these birds and uh, they're making money for their carriers. Okay, so one more quick question. Let me throw it into the chat window for this. Okay. <laughs> you got Same me. kind of problem. <laughs> I'm stuck. <laughs> There's more than one answer to this one. Oh, this way. I'm gonna I'm gonna take I'm gonna throw it out there based on the date, <laughs> I guess. Um, I'm gonna just say I'm gonna guess DC nine. Uh, not the answer there you're looking Montreux. for. Montreux. The, the, the D, not the DC-10? <laughs> is. DC-10 is correct. Oh, okay. uh, one way you can identify it, at least in this question, the way they labeled it, is the F at the end of it, at the end of the, the designation. That stands for freighter. Uh, so okay. Very often, if you see an F at the end of a model number, generally it's, it's a freighter version. 
Um, now, McDonnell Douglas did, in fact, build purpose specific freighters. Um, what I mentioned before, though, was uh, in regards to passenger jets that they did a conversion on. And some of these are combo passenger and freighters where they can use either or. But most of the DC-10s flying today in 2021 are of the freighter version, whether it was uh, converted or straight from the factory that way. Uh, most of them are that way now. Um, I don't know if the 777 is used as a freighter. That I don't know. I haven't seen any they do, specific. They do use them as freighters are converted, I should say, as ah. freighters, like Kalicha, Kalicha Cargo. Oh, OK. You know, there's like Atlas, Kalita, Southern Air. You know, they, they, Kalita uses uh, 747s as cargo. Yes, but I have seen they them. also use as passengers as well. So it's depending on what they convert them to. Yes, yes. I think FedEx may also use the 777 these days in addition to their uh, DC-10s. I'm not sure. No, I've never seen them use the 777. Uh, I, think, I think I've seen one on flight radar. So I'll have to double check, but it's an interesting thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions on that aircraft? Okay. Okay, let's, uh, let's do one more chapter and then we'll wrap it up for today. So chapter 12 is general aviation, which uh, I think a lot of us in civil air patrol are familiar with, whether as pilots or uh, maybe as air crew. Um, pilot certificate. Oh, let's start at the beginning. Instructional aviation. Uh, that has to do with teaching people how to fly. And uh, in the United States, that requires uh, certification. Um, for the pilot themselves, uh, the FAA does that uh, as far as handing out the certification. Um, you do need to uh, get qualified, and there are many ways of doing that. You do need to have a current medical exam. And uh, for pilots just starting out, that would be a class three. Uh, once you get that, you have to take various exams. And once you do that and pass them, then you can become a certified pilot. And if you want to instruct others as pilots, you need to go for additional ratings and become a certified flying instructor. And uh, that's a whole other subject. We're not gonna get into that. Uh, what are the aircraft that flight instructors use? Okay, so the textbook mentions the Cessna 152. All right, yes, that is true. Uh, the 152 has been a workforce of the training fleet today. Not so much. Um, probably the baseline model would be a Cessna 172. Um, it's ubiquitous. They made them in the thousands and uh, relatively inexpensive to operate and learn how to fly on. Um, but there are others. Uh, today, you'll find from different manufacturers, not just Cessna, you'll have Piper. Um, even some European countries have training aircraft. Uh, one that comes to mind is Diamond, and uh, they actually have a factory over in Canada. These are uh, amazing aircraft, um, but not going to go into detail right now. What other kinds of general aviation do we have? We have personal aviation. So that accounts for about a quarter of the general aviation flying. So what kinds of manufacturers of those types of airplanes do we have? So we have Beechcraft, um, they have built the Bonanza, which had come in um, single engine piston and also twin. Um, I have flown the twin engine version uh, on my flight simulator at home, which is it's a really fast airplane, 200 knots, retractable gear. It's pretty cool. Uh, then Cessna, as I mentioned before, they have several models in production, uh, primarily high wing, but there are a few that are low wing, especially uh, multi-engine. Uh, Cessnas, those are uh, primarily twins for the low wings. Four tens. And uh, we also have Mooney aircraft, which I think has shut down, unfortunately. Uh, they were known for having very fast aircraft. Uh, people who were buying them wanted to get somewhere pretty quick, maybe a business owner. They needed to hit a meeting 
in another state. And the fastest way for many years was to do it in a Mooney. Uh, Piper, ubiquitous today, many low-wing aircraft, uh, singles, twins, etc. But again, there are newer manufacturers coming out. In the last 20 years, Cirrus is a very well-known name. Uh, primarily single engine pistons, but they now have a single engine turbofan engine. And uh, the Cirrus jet uh, is relatively new for about $3 million. You can fly on a, a Cirrus jet aircraft and a single pilot. You do not need to fly with a co-pilot, which is pretty cool. Um, and there are others, but that is not really what you're going to train on. Uh, primarily uh, the ones mentioned before, Piper 140s and uh, the Cessnas as well. Then we have a different category called sport aviation or light sport aircraft, LSAs. And uh, the regulations are a little bit different for those. Uh, the bar for getting into them is a little bit lower. Um, there are seven categories. We have home belts, uh, balloons, soaring and gliders, as John, you mentioned earlier with gliders, uh, that falls under this category. And we also have antique aviation, which could be uh, old war birds from let's say World War I, perhaps World War II. And then there are the purpose-built racing aircraft. Um, off the top of my head, Red Bull has a series where uh, they do air races. It's quite fascinating to watch. I'm not sure I'd want to participate in one myself, but as long as somebody else is flying, it's, uh, it's pretty serious uh, flying what they can do. And then we also have aerobatics, which uh, if you've attended an air show, whether it was Jones Beach or elsewhere, um, we've had uh, many aerobatics demonstrate, demonstrations. Um, David Windmiller is one of the locals, Patty Wagstaff, is known nationally and internationally. And I think she may have just retired, I'm not sure. Um, but those pilots are known for doing stunts that uh, seem impossible, but uh, between the aircraft and their skills, uh, it's quite fascinating to uh, follow along. And then we also have uh, the ultralights, which could be just a fabric wing and a motor <laughs> and, and, and you're flying. Uh, again, regulations are a little bit different for those aircraft, but uh, still, if you're interested in aviation and you want to get into it, don't want to spend a lot of money, ultralights might be your ticket. Well, okay, so let's, let's do a quick quiz here, and I'll throw the first question into the chat window. And whoever wants to try and field that one, feel free. I would think, um, what? Co commercial aviation. Close, very close. Not but general, I mean, I was thinking general first. Okay, so the, the answer that they're looking for is general. And yeah, I'll tell you, why. you see that that really throws me because but I'll tell you why. I'll give you an example. Commercial aviation can include scheduled aircraft. So if we have, let's say, a corporate division of some big company, they may have CEOs on a schedule, and even though it's not uh, a regular flight. Uh, it does fall under commercial aviation because uh, someone's paying for it and it's a corporation doing that. Oh. So it could be scheduled. You see, I, you see, Trevor, this is really important. I read it wrong. So <laughs> I could see well, why, you, why you thought that might be correct. And I read it wrong because it, again, other, yes, it depends on the question. Right, other than. Well, I'm so, going to say this. Um, when you're doing the FAA and or, and or, the journey of flight, make sure you read the questions very carefully yeah. before attempting to answer. Or if you read it, most of the answers, read it again yeah. before you select an answer. 
One hundred percent. I'm yeah. learning it over and over again. One thing I can tell you in aviation, interpretation of questions is very important. Yes. <laughs> Make sure you read the questions carefully because you might see a question that you're familiar with in terms of the answer and you boom, you select an answer, but <laughs> it's not the correct answer. That's right. <laughs> Make sure you that's understand what you're reading, you know? Why don't you make you smack you in the head? <laughs> that's that's one of those gotchas, and they will do it. So yeah, that's a gotcha. Uh, especially on the Yeager exam. Again, take your time with it. Um, don't worry about the clock. Uh, have your information open in another window. And any question when I took it myself, I always knew what the answer was, but I always had that. You know, that doubt in the back of my mind, am I reading the wording correctly? And I'll go back to the original um, part in the chapter where it was coming from. And I reread exactly what they say in the paragraph and then reread the question itself and make sure that the wording matches. Because if there's a difference in there, it could be a gotcha. And uh, you don't want to get those easy ones wrong because of the wording. I so. found those. I'm taking you a, a, a UAS. Um, a practice course, a practice test right now as we speak, and I see it all the time. I see yeah, it all the so, time. All right, yeah. there you go. All right, let's do question number two. I'm going to put that in. And I guess, uh, John, see if you can feel this one as well. I'm going to say sport. Okay, so that's wrong too. <laughs> it's not the one that they're looking for. And I, I understand I understand why, why you were what, you were going with looking? sport. What do they want? Uh, they wanted personal. Now wow. that's that's a little tricky there. I, I agree. That's not a really great question. I don't like that one. <laughs> and, and, and and by the way, um David, it's it's a I think even with the FAA, a lot of their questions sometimes are ambiguous. Yes. And, um, it, it, you have multiple answers for the same question, and sometimes it throws you off. It's just one of those things that you're ever less about. You yeah. know? But just try to select the, the most and best favorable answer yeah. to the question. I mean, I, I can agree with John on this. I don't understand why sport would be incorrect. Uh, because it matches what they're looking for. It's not under um, business or commercial. So it technically could be correct if, if you ask me. But all right, and that's, that's what they have. And we'll go with that for now. <laughs> and we'll move along. So let me- It'll be more on the, on the line of general aviation. Yeah. You know, I understand the context in which they are, they are, they are they're asking the question, but as you said, yeah, it's, it's could be personal, it could be sport. Yeah. All right. So let me do question number three, and then I guess we'll try to wrap it up. Here's number three. And this one might be a little difficult also. And I don't know if it's still correct, but I have a feeling it is. Once, once we talk about the answer. <laughs> it might not. I, I got to do, do process of elimination. Let me see if I can do this by process of elimination. Sure. I'm going to, out is Mooney. Bye-bye. <laughs> and that'd be, fun, that'd be funny if that's the answer. <laughs> no, you're, you're good so far. Okay, that's good. So, um, I know Cessna, I know Beach, I know Piper. Cessna is um, world's largest manufacturer general aviation. But Cessna is being used for training. I'm going to stick with I'm going to stick with C Cessna right now, just for a moment. I haven't answered the question yet. Is that your final answer? <laughs> <laughs> when you want up, David prompting you. <laughs> right. Okay. Just for time's sake, that's my final answer. Okay, you are correct. It is Cessna. <laughs> okay. Uh, again, I'm not. But I was sure. also looking at Piper, and I was thinking of between the two. I would have. Piper I would might have be the second largest. 
Um, it's also interesting just in recent years, I don't know if the numbers have changed. If I were answering this today, I'd say it's probably still Cessna. And I'll give you one example, uh, Civil Air Patrol. Um, I don't know if it's been mentioned, but we have approximately 500 and I think 50 aircraft. Most of them are Cessnas. We have uh, the largest, I think it's the private, largest private fleet in the country of Cessna aircraft and it's Civil Air Patrol. So that's one little factoid that's of interest. And yes, whether it's uh, a training aircraft or mission-based aircraft, like what we use them for, uh, Cessnas are out there. And uh, over time, uh, Civil Air Patrol will rotate aircraft in and out of usage um, as they get older and pass their due date. Um, the Civil Air Patrol will sell them and uh, they get new aircraft uh, periodically. In fact, uh, I forgot what the numbers are, but uh, they get a handful of new ones every year. So as the old ones cycle through, uh, they do pick up new ones and uh, the Air Force, uh, thank, thank the Air Force, they uh, provide the funding to allow that to happen. And many of the new ones, if not all, are coming with the glass panels. And uh, there are still some with the steam gauges, but mm. most of CAP is switching over to um, the glass panel cockpits because it makes it a lot easier to perform our missions. And if they task us with search and rescue or disaster assistance, relief, whatever, um, if we can plug in uh, GPS coordinates, Latin long, it's much easier on the glass panel. So uh, most aircraft, if they aren't already, uh, they are going to become uh, glass panels in CAP very soon. So uh, as I mentioned, they do cycle through um, different, uh, different aircraft over time. Um, but the ones at Long Island Group, I believe are all glass panels. Is that correct, Trevor? The ones that we yes, have? Um, the, the 182, the turbo is glass cockpit G1000. And I think the Cessna 206 is also uh, glass as well. Uh -huh. Trevor, are you, are you located at the FISDO in Farmingdale? Is that where your office is? Well, well I, 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 I do flight instruction out of there as well. Um, I do it with, um, I usually do with a number of different guys, but they have closed down over the years. Um, but right now I'm with, um, um, I think, New York King um, Aviation. And um, I think I was trying to get on to uh, uh, Farmingdale Aviation. I did my ATP course there. Um, yeah. But I usually fly a lot over there with New York Flight Academy or Louis Flight Academy. Usually fly down by uh, Danny back in the days and um, Icon Aviation. But Trevor, you're based on um, Farmingdale, correct? Yes, I do fly with um, King Aviation. I think Flight King Aviation. Okay. Flight King Flight School. Uh, just so just so Don knows, the uh, Civil Air Patrol for Long Island Group has the aircraft based at MacArthur. Yeah, that's what I yeah. heard. Yeah. They usually yeah. have it based at Farmingdale, but no longer. It's based yes. at MacArthur, down by the airport, down by the group headquarters. So any missions that we are tasked to fly uh, will happen out of MacArthur from our headquarters, group headquarters there. Yes. However, our meetings uh, for our squadron, New York 207, um, when we are meeting in person, that would happen at Republic at uh, Farmingdale. Right. Got and we have nearby uh, White Plains as well. That's where, where I think our WE headquarters is at. Correct. Well, this is this is wonderful, guys, because it, it gets you thinking. It gets you, you know, it gets you thinking about this. I, I, I'm just going to say one thing because the way. I like taking the tests, especially the 107 tests, because I, this is my, I'm on my second recurrent. And if I'm not careful, Trevor, I will absolutely make a mistake. So you caught me, you caught me here. And it really, it really is important. 
but I like the task of really trying to figure out what they want based on the, but I feel that I learn better when I'm taking more to test, 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 test. On the, now I'm talking about 107. I'm not talking about what we just learned today. I'm just talking about 107 because it seems that when it, it'll, it, at the end, it'll give you the right answers and then it will tell you where to go get the reading. It'll say, yeah, here, here's the answer. This is where, this is where you found, you know, this is where it's found. And I find that is for me, and I'm a visual guy. You probably already realize I'm more of a visual guy. Helps me start retaining this type of um, uh, knowledge. And I only bring that up because we all learn differently. Yeah. And how do we how, how do we help everybody who learns differently? It's a very it's a it's a it's a, a very hard task. Absolutely. Well, that boils down to your method of studying as well um everybody learns different some people yeah. like going to groups some people like to read on their own some people go with visual other video uh, audio visual aids um but the bottom line for any knowledge test like multiple choice questions it's a knowledge base so if you do not have the knowledge followed by the understanding then you won't be able to choose the correct answer right so you got to make sure you have the knowledge first and the understanding of what is read and that will help you to come up with the correct answer That's and true. practice of course the more you practice you, the, the more you'll see how they structure these questions and you know by process of elimination. I heard you talk about that earlier on, John. That's very helpful. With multiple choice, that's the best way to figure out something. If you have the knowledge and even if you don't have, process of elimination. The, and how multiple choice are set up, they will give you two close answers and two far out answers. So if you can eliminate the far out answers first, then it leaves you with the two closest answers. Then you eliminate the one that you don't, don't think makes sense. So if you try that approach, it will help you to come up with the correct answers when you get to those situations. Process of elimination. Mm -hmm. And remember, as I said, multiple choice questions will always sit like this. Two close answers, two far out answers. So, they try to trick you in a sense yeah, to test your knowledge. So if you can get rid of the two answers that has nothing to do with the question and narrow that down to the answers that are very close, then it puts you in a much better position to select the correct answer. So just watch okay. for that. Okay, and we're at the three hour mark. Does anyone have any questions about what was covered or not covered? No questions. Okay. Comment. Fantastic job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Very help. It's it, this is helpful. I'm sorry I missed the first one. No problem. Like I said, it's going to be uh, uploaded some at some point in the near future, so it will become available for everyone. Uh, downloading whatever you need uh, it's there and and john again once you do get access to e-services you'll be able to download this material it's going to be uh, broken up into chapters and you just download each one separately and then uh, you can read them as uh, as you wish okay thanks all right so we're going to wrap this up here are you going to do it next sunday the same time david is that the I, idea I think there's a conflict. I think there's a training session happening uh, next week. So um, we're going to have to discuss it uh, offline. And then uh, once um, Trevor and I have a date in mind, we're going to publish that out and we're going to send it to the uh, squadron once uh, we're sure there's no apparent conflict, as best as we can <laughs> be certain. There, there are a few things coming up in the next uh, next few weekends. So uh, it may be three to four weeks out till the oh, next okay. one. And on the 28th, we have triax 
and then I think next week Sunday we might have something else. Um, so yes, we're gonna be busy uh, coming down to the end of the month. Do you find that most of the things that you do happen on Sundays? Is that what you find in general with with your squadron, or no? Not necessarily weekends. Weekends. Okay. weekends. Well, weekends, right? Weekends is mostly when it happens, correct? Yes. But once in a while, they will have something in the week as well. If it if it's has more than one days, like uh, Air Force evaluation might sometimes occur in the week or leading up to the weekend. You know, it depends. You know, but as David said, um, mostly on a weekend. Okay. And try to just, just to add to what Trevor just said, um, we uh, Trevor and I actually are taking an airborne photography uh, class. Uh, under Civil Air Patrol. And in our particular case, the class is meeting Tuesday evening. So it's, uh, I think it's a 10 week class. So every Tuesday night for those 10 weeks, uh, we have that. Um, there may be other classes, other training um, that will happen during the year. And there will be emails being sent out from different uh, people, whether it's the commander of our uh, unit or from Long Island Group. Uh, you will get notifications uh, periodically of different kinds of training and depending on what level you're at, it may be appropriate for you to take them. And one thing I can advise you is if you are qualified to take some of these classes, when they're given, if you can, please try to, to sign up and take them and get them done because you don't always know when the next round will occur and it may be a while it could be a few years uh until people are able to give that same class again so as they pop up do try to attend if at all possible um like trevor and i we uh we found out about this airborne photography class that just came up and it was like perfect let's do it so it's uh, it's very relevant for air crew and uh I haven't, uh, haven't seen a class given for it um, in my time and I'm in for three years now. So to me, it was, it was a perfect, uh, perfect alignment of the schedule and uh, they were able to give it and I'm, I'm like, let's, let's take it. So once I do that and hopefully if I get signed off and Trevor gets signed off, we will be uh, qualified as airborne photographers. And uh, right now I was told there are very few of them in Long Island group. So the mm -hmm. more people who can become qualified and again, this is just one example. There are other positions you can aim for. You don't necessarily need to pursue air crew. Uh, there are ground team uh, member options that you can pursue and there will be training for that periodically. So you do have various uh, paths you can pursue um, this is just the one that uh, he and I are going after. Um, but again, just to reiterate, when training comes up, if you can, please try to uh, take advantage of them um, okay. because we don't know. Uh, obviously, the more instructors there are, uh, it does help. So if you wanted to, at some point, you could even give a class yourself. I must point out, though, that one other way to also get qualified in, in a lot of areas is, you know, every year NISA offers courses up by Indianapolis Camp Atterbury, and they offer a wide variety of courses, whether um, airborne photography, air crew, scanner, I mean, uh, observer, mission pilot, water survival, um, they offer a bunch of courses, so you can also, one way to get qualified quickly is to attend NISO when, when, when you become a what full does that member. Stand, what does that stand for? Uh, National Emergency, um, I think, Academy? Services Academy. Services Academy. So that's another way, if you, if you do not get to the squadron level or the group or wing level, then you can go up there and just sign up for the courses. You have to pay your own plane fare and contribute something towards, um, you know, food and so on. But once you get there, you attend, it's like a campus. You attend these different, different courses. People from all over in, in CAP will be doing different stuff. Last, I think last two years, I attended as a mission pilot, intermediate. 
was great. You know, you get to meet a lot of people, get to do a lot of stuff. So that's one way to get qualified as well. And they, 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 I'm assuming they charge for that, correct? Well, you have to pay your own plane fare. They pick you up at the airport. Accommodation, they provide the accommodation at the army base. It's an army base. Okay. And um, and then they will drive you out to the airport. That's if you have to go to the airport, like for air crew. For so what you have to. So what you're saying, this is is this a free? You just have to get yourself there. Is that accurate? Yeah, you gotta pay your plane fare, but you also have to contribute to um, like towards meals. Like I think maybe a hundred dollars or less or fifty dollars or whatever they tell you. It's not. It's not. The a, rest. Not they work out the rest. They work, I got work out the rest. That bad. You I get it. Fine. You know, okay. But everything else is taken care of. You get a nice bar crew to sleep in. <laughs> and, you know, you get to meet a lot of people. It's fun. I would think so. Yeah. Well, thank you, guys. Really appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you for attending. Okay. See you next time. When we do have our next session, we will continue where we left off. So we're up to chapter 13 and there are 27 altogether. So we'll do a few chapters next time and uh, we'll take it from there. All right, hopefully by then I'll have my credentials to get in and I can bring it down. My 107 will be passed. I can tell you guys, I passed. And, yeah. then, um, <laughs> and then I can start looking at this really awesome. serious, you know, start really trying to you know, come on board with level one. It'd be great. Thanks. Awesome. Great. Great. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank well, have you. Have a good Thanks. afternoon, everyone. Enjoy your weekend. So long. Thank you. Do guys be safe. Stay oh, well. Good too.